Hello, everybody. This is Joshua Hatton with One Nation Under Whiskey Podcast. I'm joined today, and I'm joined as always, whether it's 2021, 2020, 2022 now, uh, by my good friend, my business partner, my dear, my dear everything, almost everything, uh, Jason Johnston <laughs> Yellen. <laughs> You had my attention at everything, gosh. Uh, I tell you, Jason, um, I know how you're doing. You're doing fine, so I'm not going to ask you that. But I'm going to I'm gonna let you know, and I'm going to let my my listeners, our listeners. Yeah, your listeners. Yeah, I'm going to let my <laughs> listeners know. I'm not talking to your listeners right now. I'm talking to my listeners. Uh, <laughs> two very different groups of listeners. Two very different. Um, I decided... To start the new year out wrong and and pour a glass because I'm in a very angry mood. And I told you about this before we started recording. I'm really angry. I'm really upset. I'm feeling on edge. So I decided to open and pour uh, a little Bruchlati coming of age, which, as you know, and as some of our listeners know, I've called this the best worst whiskey in the world. I just love the fact that we're four days into the new business year mm -hmm. and you have already ripped the cork out of the coming of age. It, you know, I didn't think it would happen on, on, <laughs> on this day, but here we are with it <laughs> happening on this day. And, and I'm counting on you to get me over this, this hump here because I am a angry fucking bear right now well i'm i'm telling you along with the assistance of my listeners we will all work <laughs> together to get you through this That's, we will work diligently um i was i was actually going to make just a nice kind of throwaway oh. uh, observation about the the 2022 on tuesday our our very own dear jess mm -hmm. did the same thing that i did on Monday, when you and I had, you know, the very first uh, meeting of, of this new calendar year mm -hmm. on January 3rd. And I had said on the Monday, 2020, and then moved on to another thought. And you'd said, uh, 2022, you mean? And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, I just got bored with the date and I just didn't finish it before I moved on to my next thought. <laughs> And on the Tuesday, yeah. Jess did the exact same thing, stated the year as 2020 and immediately moved on to a new thought. And when I said, yeah. don't you mean 2022? She said the exact same thing. I was just done with the date at that point. I'd, I'd given enough details. Is it because 2022, much like 2021, doesn't feel too much different from 2020? You're like, yeah, 2020, <laughs> yeah, moving on. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was thinking about it myself where 2022, like you've already given a full year and then you got to add another word on the end of it. But that was also true of 2021. And I mm. mostly said 2021 right to the end. So I, I like your observation that it might just look a lot like 2020. But the reason I bring it up is that gives me a little story about the new year. Gives mm. Jess a little story about the new year. You had your own little story about the new year. Is it my travel story? Nope. Hmm. The Instead story. of calling it 2022, you called it... 2020 as well? What did I call it? Ugh. 1922. Oh, I did. Yes, that's right. Oh, I had to think about that. Yeah, I woke up. And I said to Haida, I said, welcome to 1922. <laughs> and that's when she said, it's not 1922. And I said, you're right. It is 2022. I, I don't know how that came up. <laughs> Do you think 1922 was a better year than what 2022 will be? Probably not. Because you, you had prohibition. Mm -hmm. You had the end of the so-called Spanish flu, mm -hmm. and you, uh, you were six years away from the beginning of the Great Depression. So I don't know if it was a little calm in the midst of a storm, but what were the years for Prohibition? Uh, 
It was until 1933, December 5, 1933, if I'm remembering that correctly. Yeah, correct it was Dece- December 5, I remember that, just because my birthday is December 6. 1933. And, and what, ni- was it 1918 when World War I ended? Indeed, also, yep. So, so that's kind of good, right? You're not, you're, at least you're not in a world war. At, at least. But you know what? We're, we're not <laughs> currently in a world war. Well, keep your eyes on Ukraine and <laughs> Kazakhstan and Syria. And... Uh, no, anyway. We, yeah, we have Borat is going to help us out in Kazakhstan, so don't you worry about that. Question. Go ahead. What did you kick off the new year with drinks-wise? Like, was there a special dram to, to set the stage, set the tone yeah. for the new year? Yeah. Did you do that? I kicked off the new year... The same way you did, Jason. It was over a dram of <laughs> m and pomegranate cask, the Apex. <laughs> <laughs> you had so much, you don't remember. <laughs> I think in the business, they call that a setup. Ah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I think you're right. It is a setup. It was a setup. Did you do much boozing on the New Year's Eve? A little bit. Um, we had a small gathering. I had, uh, let me see, we had some neighbors over. I drank a lot of Riesling and some Muscat and some Sherry. But I also had some some whiskeys as well. I had, what did I have, Jason? Crap, I don't remember what the hell I had to drink. <laughs> Just I had some whiskeys. <laughs> I, had, I had some whiskeys. For me, like a, anything that was in my my glass was really inconsequential. I decided this past New Year's mm. Eve to focus less on what is in my glass and more on who I'm with. And and it was just so nice being with uh, my neighbors, the Fissels, and our other next door neighbor, Linda. And we just played Cards Against Humanity. We ate a lot of cheese. We had some hummus. I mean, it was it was just it was a night, and I fell asleep at eleven fifty two. Like you, you couldn't ask for a better New Year's Eve. What about you? What did did you uh, have a dramathon? I did not. Nope. I uh, nope. I read my book. I went to bed early. I called it quits. And then it wasn't until even January second that I had that nice little New Year dram with you and caught up on the holidays. Yeah, I was just, just chill. I did say to you, this is worth sharing with both my listeners and your listeners, but <laughs> <laughs> I I reached a point on the Monday of, of vacation. And so it would have been Monday the 27th. Okay. I reached a point there where I was really deep into festive imbibing. Like hmm. I'd I'd managed to go for a good number of days where I was kind of like, all right, we've reached eleven a.m. What's a good eleven a.m. drink? Oh yeah, and then yeah. and and then how, how would that set me up for my lunchtime drink? <laughs> and then what's the mid afternoon reading slash playing games with the kids slash watching a movie with the kids <laughs> drink going to be? And how will that set me up for my dinner drink? And obviously. There's a dinner prep drink that has to set you up for your dinner drink and then your evening drink. I I feel as if you took the the hobbits approach <laughs> to to drinking. They're like, well, we got breakfast and then we have second breakfast and then we have eleven C's. <laughs> and right, and it's the same thing, just just with drinks, but yet you start at eleven. You started at eleven C's, basically. I, I did, and, and I also oh, had okay. one hundred and eleven T drinks over the festive season so out. i really out. i really ramped up the hobbit on approach there and so so that was i'm not gonna lie to you it was a ton of fun i was having a blast and then i got to the tuesday uh the the december 28 and i thought to myself so? what if i could go through today without a drink mm. And and by the time I got to mid-afternoon, I was thinking to myself, 
you know, I could just pour a drink because I've reached mid-afternoon. I think that says something. And then I thought, well, if I've made it to mid-afternoon, let's see if I can make it to dinner prep. And then I made it to dinner prep. And then I thought, I've made it to dinner prep. Let's see if I can make it to dinner. And then I made it to dinner. And, And I'll be honest with you. See, as I sat there during the evening, I was like... I need to pour something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have to pour something. I've made it this far. <clears throat> and I thought to myself, this doesn't sound healthy. And so I did not pour anything at all on that okay. Tuesday. Oh, wow. Look at you. Look at you. Right? Fucking hero. Right? Fucking hero. Right? But, yeah. but I clearly thought about it from mid-afternoon until bedtime. <laughs> like, why shouldn't I pour something, right? Get, getting nice and indignant. Yeah. And then then I went through the Wednesday, and it was really only till about kind of dinner time that I thought, should I have something with dinner? Nah, let's keep going. And then I got to the Thursday, and, and it was only in the evening, and I was kind of like, should I have something in the evening? Nah. Hmm. And so I went all of Tuesday, all of Wednesday, all of Thursday without any festive boozing Mm -hmm. and I thought that was a nice little demonstration but I'll be honest with you that Tuesday where I was thinking about it so much I was like that's not good so Mm -mm. I was glad I could I could draw a line in the sand I could I could stick a flag in said sand (laughs) we said all the wrong words there and and then when it got to the new years I was like yeah I'll probably have a few things for the new year but I wasn't crazy about it um i did have a friend gift me a rather significant beer that mm. was one of those you know 13 yeah, percent yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. barrel aged beers and so that that was a bit that was a lot um and then i had a nice little 1989 caden heads glen talkers oh i know the i know the one we have the same bottle yep right yep, yep, yep. that's really delicious yep, it's a special and whiskey. so and so that was it. That was the new year. Saturday, I then didn't have a drink. And then on the Sunday, the January 2nd, I had that nice little dram session with you to to welcome in the new year. Um, but I, yeah, festive, festive imbibing is, it is a wonderful thing, but I think it starts to lay some some significant groundwork. <laughs> well, it does. And, and, and someone who has both friends and family uh, in in the Alcoholics Anonymous program, uh, mm. which which you know by its very nature, I can't mention who they are. Um, mm. I I do know that they don't give out tokens by the hour, Jason. So I know you're <laughs> feeling real proud of yourself there. But uh, three days, man. Three days, three full <laughs> days. Sun up, sun down. Three full days. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think. Earlier on in 2020, and we've discussed this a few times, where I've mentioned there, I would go long stretches of time where I simply didn't want anything to drink, be it beer, whiskey, wine, anything. And I, I would mm. go a week, two weeks, whatever, unless, <laughs> unless we're, you know, doing samples and something like that, but just <laughs> drinking for the sake of enjoying that flavor and maybe wanting another yeah. pour. I just, I was happy to be taking a break from it, but this festive season, and and I think that New Year's Eve was a good indication of that. I told you I was just drinking a lot of Riesling and a lot of Muscat and just a lot of this and a lot of that, and and beer. Like I've been mm. going he- heavy on the beer. And by heavy, that means I've had a beer a night, right? Which that's kind of big for me. I'm usually like a beer every few weeks kind of a person. Um, but yeah, I, well, let me ask you this uh, before we start introducing our guest. Yeah. Do you have a New Year's resolution? No, I don't do them. I've never done them. I don't believe in them. Wow. I don't waste my time. You, you, like, you don't believe in them as in, as in they don't exist, or you believe one shouldn't wait until the new year to make a resolution or to make a change? Very much that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, if something needs done, do it like, <laughs> like on December 28, decide you're going to you know, not drink for a whole day. <laughs> don't wait till January 1, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, seize the moment, carpe diem. Um, 
So, so, so no. But t- tell me, I, I'm, I'm assuming this is a setup for. Do you have a, a resolution? Is that what they call them? A New Year's resolution? That is what they call them, and yes, they do exist. But no, I didn't make one because that's just not how I work. You know me. When I put my mind to something, I definitely do it. If I publicly announce that I'm going to resolve to do X, for whatever reason, I fail on that. But if I just internally (laughs) say I'm going to do this and just move on with my day, then it actually happens. So I've decided that because in January 19, 2021, I started running. I decided that that is just a resolution that I'm going to keep that come, you know, the 19th, I will have been running almost every single day uh, for a full year. And I'm just going to continue doing that because I've actually started to enjoy it. And I'm going to continue paying attention to my body and my health and looking after myself so I don't get to a to an unhealthy place, which is where I was. And so so there isn't a new resolution, but uh and, and January nineteen, twenty twenty one wasn't me making a New Year's resolution. It was me <laughs> looking in the mirror, seeing how uh unhealthy I, I both looked and felt and decided I'm gonna make a change. So So I'm gonna offer up something for our listeners to resolve to do. Mm, okay. Which is, I, I want our listeners to to pour themselves, make themselves, mm. and enjoy themselves a Toronto. Mm. I, I fell in love with the Toronto over Thanksgiving. I don't know what this is. What is this? Absolutely spectacular. Two ounces mm. of rye... Okay. I've been using Old Forester. Oh, good. Beautiful rye. A very, Beautiful. Very tasty little rye. Mm-hmm. And to that two ounces of rye, you add one quarter ounce of fernet. Okay. I use the California fernet. And one quarter ounce maple syrup. Two ounces rye. Three quarters ounce fernet. What, one how much, quarter ounce. One quarter ounce for that. And how much maple syrup? One quarter ounce. So I thought that that was called a Canucistani. You're telling me that's called the, the Toronto. That's fine. Um, so tell me, but I've never, seriously, in all honesty, I've never heard of this drink. What does it taste yeah, like? Yeah, no, m- me neither. So I, I'd, a while ago, I picked up a bottle of Fernet because I was kind of like, Fernet, what's that like? And then I tasted it, and I was like, oh, that's a lot. <laughs> that's, mm. that's really a lot. And so I sat with the bottle on my fridge for about six months, <laughs> thinking to myself, how the hell am I going to use up a full bottle of Fernet? Mm-hmm. And so over Thanksgiving, I looked up Fernet cocktails. Uh. And and so the, the, I saw this variation called the Toronto. And you just... Those are the three base ingredients. You stir them in a mixing glass with ice, and then you strain them into a, a coupe, a coupe, um, with a little twist of orange peel. I was going to ask if you would do orange, because orange makes good sense with those c- right? combinations. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. And that one quarter ounce of fernet shines through. Mm-hmm. And that one quarter ounce of maple syrup just gives it a nice little sweetness without being cloying. To my mind, it's a weighty sweetness mm. that I thoroughly enjoy. Texture too, and right? Adds a bit of mm-hmm, texture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's just, it feels both decadent and refreshing. And so I was, mm. I was making them both over Thanksgiving, then over winter break. Um, I was making them to accompany my dinner prep. And so having one of those while you're making dinner, God, feels fantastic. Feels really good. I would do, I would, I would change that up a little bit. I would put a few cloves, uh, I almost said cloves of garlic. That's not, that's not what I meant. I would not put cloves of garlic. I would put some actual whole clove in that and shake it. Let the clove break up a little bit. 
and then strain it so the clove doesn't get in because that will go with the orange real nice. I would worry that it would overpower. I think you'd have to be careful with the clove addition. And my concern is the clove would hinder some of the refreshing qualities of it. Like Correct. that mintiness from the fernet, I like coming through just a little bit. I'd worry that the mintiness with a clove winteriness might not work. Yeah, so one is before the new year with the clove. <laughs> one is after the new year without the clove. That's how you do it. <laughs> but anyway, I hope the listeners give the old Toronto a try. Yeah. Uh, really, really tasty. Tons Beautiful. of fun. So Beautiful. That was one of the one of the many cocktails uh, that I was making over the festive season. But oh. anyway, we have we have business to get to. We we do. Let me let me just say, add the clove, and we'll call it the Quebecois. There, there you go. I just <laughs> I just made a new cocktail. Okay, yeah. So I'm I'm really happy for this conversation uh, that we're about to share with our guests because it aligns itself with with what our main goal was or what our main goal we stated would be when we started the the podcast. And that was that we wanted to make sure we were focusing on independent bottlers. And yep. here we are still in our fifth season, right? We may be in a new year, but we're not in a new season yet. And we have yet to have anyone come on to discuss uh, Duncan Taylor. And, and our guest today, Pete Curry, who a lot of our listeners may know, is also someone you and I have known for for nigh on many years. And yeah, many, many. And we, we said it to him, I think I think perhaps while recording, that that it was a glaring hole that somehow we had a blind spot on that 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 we didn't have him on the podcast. So having an, an old friend within the industry on the podcast was good fun because it was nice to catch up with him. It was really nice to hear his story. But then it just felt great to you know, come through again on a promise to have a, you know, to, to bring the focus back on to independent bottling. That was just nice to live in that world again for me. And, and as we'll, you know, go through in the interview here, getting to talk with someone whose whiskey life just so perfectly lines up with the recent rise of whiskey. Mm -hmm. I just, I love listening to his story and, you know, even from his dad into Pete himself in the late 90s, into a store, into a distillery, into an independent bottling company, into a move to the United States. Like it just charts the whole rise yep, yep. of whiskey. This, this, you know, an insane growing demand for it all. And now, into importing as well so he's he's lived a life in in two decades uh, you know a little bit here more on the front here more on the end of those two decades <laughs> but yeah it's, it's a great story and i really enjoyed spending time with them it was such an easy conversation yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I, I loved it i had a blast yeah yeah it, it was great and, and i regret Having to leave it a bit early, I think our listeners will hear it. I had to, I had to pop off a bit early, but you guys carried on the conversation. We did, we did, and uh, and I feel as if there's likely a second conversation uh, not too far away with Pete, too. Yeah, yeah. I think you know doing that deep dive into importation, where we've we've done it with Sam Filmus in a in a prior episode importation is not something that we tend to get into. We discussed it with Raj Sabarwal, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah, sure. Um, but it's not really something we tend to get into. And, and I think it's interesting. And how do you bring brands into mm -hmm. the United States in this current example? And then how do you build those brands? It's, uh, yeah, that, that can be fascinating in its own right. So I agree. Uh, a part two will be in the future at some point. Hopefully in person, right? Shared drums. That's, that's the hope. I I, you know, now that you've you've co you've come off the uh, the three day hiatus of, of drinking, <laughs> I, I think 
it requires that we have some <laughs> drinks with with Pete Curry on on the West Coast. Yeah. yeah. To, to be clear, it was four full days out of five. So I think that's <laughs> <laughs> that's how you measure these things, right? Let's hand it over to ourselves with Pete, and uh, and then after the conversation, we'll share a bit of news, and there are a couple other odds and ends that we just want to uh, bring to our listeners' attention. So without further ado, Mr. Pete Curry. Pete Curry, thank you so much for joining us. I think I've got your title right, that you are the FLDIC, Forklift Driver in Chief, is that... Yeah, exactly. That's for the last two years. That's all I've been doing. I've actually got two forklifts now. <laughs> Ooh, some. Yeah. I've got a gas some one bragger. and an electric one. How are things going at Bragger School? Jeez. Exactly. Yeah. Do you have your some own people, solar panel? Some people collect fancy cars. I collect forklifts. <laughs> Do you have your own solar panel on the electric? Not yet, but I think that that will be coming. It'll be uh, it'll be a solar panel on the roof of the warehouse at some point, I would imagine. <laughs> um, I remember, you know, year, years ago when Jason and I first started the podcast, the idea was that, you know, first and foremost, it was going to be a, an industry podcast to try to have a peek behind the curtain into the industry. And then secondarily, we wanted to focus on independent bottlers. And both Jason and I, as you realize before we press record, have moved forward with the belief that that you were directly employed with Duncan Taylor, and and now we're, we're, what we're understanding is that you are with the with Shand Import, who is the importer of Duncan Taylor. Yeah, I was I was with Duncan Taylor for you know seven or eight years. Um, and originally moved across, I mean, back then Duncan Taylor had, uh, it was Anchor, Price Imports, which became Anchor, who were the US uh, importer. And yeah. around 2014, we, we set up Shand Import, but I was still working for Duncan Taylor. Um, and it just made sense because I was, you know, I was based in the US and everything just got kind of moved into the Shand Import and, and I'm now a partner in Shand Import. So... Yeah. Um, yeah, working with the whole portfolio, but and importing Duncan Taylor, obviously in their range of casks and blends, and uh, yeah. got it. Yeah. Well, so so Jason, did you want to add you, anything? Please, okay, please continue. Good. Thank you. Well, in a way, th- this is this is good because you know, obviously, we, we want to learn about Duncan Taylor, and I, I'm really keen to to hear some of the history. Uh, around Duncan Taylor, but now we get to ask some some questions around importation and and difficulties there, which you know we're, we're all dealing with now, you know, and then the difficulties before that that we were dealing with, with tariffs and, and things like that. But um, w- what I was leading up to say before is, as a podcast that wanted to focus on independent bottlers. It was a glaring hole that we that we haven't had you on the podcast before to discuss Duncan Taylor. So Agreed really, on that count. Yes. So we're really excited to have you on. So I wonder for our listeners, if you can go over some of the history regarding uh, Duncan Taylor, its establish, uh, when it was established and, 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 and its growth. Um, yeah, so D- Duncan Taylor, a blender, broker, and bottler of... Scotch whiskey, um, rum, and you know some other uh, any spirits really. So um, it was Duncan Taylor was started in 1938 um, in Glasgow. Not really sure of the the kind of um, records around that time, but it it was a few years later. It was bought by um, a New Yorker by a guy called Abe Rosenberg. And Abe Rosenberg... Nice Irish guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of the Dufton Rosenbergs. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Abe Rosenberg was... I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say he was a kind of Nookie Thompson, 
boardwalk empire type character. You know, right, yeah. you don't. He he had started importing Jane B and Cutty Sark straight after Prohibition. Oh wow! So so it obviously a, and 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 Black Bull was a brand that he imported out. I mean, Black Bull the the, the trade was trademarked in New York in 1933. Ah, and you okay. you don't. I mean, that's that's not a market you walk into from from bootleggers and and kind of Prohibition gangsters. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's fair to say he must have had a fairly tough edge to him <laughs> to be in that, to be in that in, in that business at that time. Um, and he's he's a fascinating character. Um, and there's you know he has a, a a trust and does a lot of charitable work. And as as I think many Americans who become wealthy do, it's like you you know you you. Uh, paper over the, the the toughness that got you there and you become philanthropic and you know um, but <laughs> yeah, he's a really interesting put. character and, and I think if you one of the most one of the most interesting things I read about him was in the the Bronfman the, the, the book about the Bronfman family of Seagram's mm-hmm. and he was involved with Sam Bronfman um, and importing you know Seagram's Canadian whiskey and um, into the US again before Prohibition and after and, and, and Abe Rosenberg gets a name check in, uh, in, in that book so he was quite a character and, hmm. and as I say Jane B. Cutty Sark he was distributing um, I think his company was called Star Industries okay. which is, is still on the go um, and I remember I was in New York I was in a, a retailer and they pulled out the what's the New York the magazine the price posting uh, uh, seven fifty. Well, the, the the old one. It was anyway. It was okay. from the nineteen thirties. This guy had a copy, and there was Star Industries and Black Bull, and J and B, and you know, um, oh, railroad wow. scotch, and, okay. and and at that time, uh, he bought Black Bull and and started laying down casks. Started buying casks for the blend. Um, I think Black Bull was was doing about sixty, seventy thousand cases, mostly in the northeast. So it was a reasonable sized brand yeah. in, in yeah. you know, Connecticut, Massachusetts, um, Rhode Island, places like that. And, mm-hmm. and he was buying casks. That's where it started. He was just buying casks for blending. Um, so, so the Duncan Taylor brand was initially grown off the back of, of Black Bull in the 30s then? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, I don't really think Duncan Taylor was... was was doing much in the way of bottling of, of single malts. It was a it was a broker. The Rosenberg family were were brokering casks. They were, you know, other independent bottlers were buying casks from uh, from Duncan Taylor before before you and Shand bought it. But mm-hmm. it was a you know a holding company. He was buying casks for blending. And I, I, I I've tried. If you ever had the chance, some of the you still find them actually. Our uh, big Robert Horton got me a a bottle of Black Bull from the 1970s that he found in a store in Northern California for about $28. <laughs> um, and that's, that's very cool. And Black Bull around that time was five-year-old Macallan and five-year-old Bowmore. That's what the blend. That, that's it. It was, it was two malts together, five-year-old Macallan and five-year-old Bowmore. The malt, so it's, it's 50% malt, malt 50% yeah, grain bottled 50% at 50% grain. alcohol. And the malt component was five-year-old Macallan and five-year-old Bowmore. Oh Good Predominantly. <laughs> um, <laughs> what a time to be alive. I know, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, so Abe, Abe Rosenberg was, was laying down stock for, you know, for blending and was buying from, from, from other distilleries and, um, you know, buying... Capardonic and Banff and uh, distilleries like that. A lot of Glen Grant, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, a lot of the things that the distilleries that Duncan Taylor's now known for. Um, a lot of Macallan, obviously, for blending and sure. And so when he wrote, when he when he passed away, I think his family discovered they had, you know, four thousand casks of sitting in distilleries throughout Scotland, um, and they wanted to sell it. They wanted to sell the whole lot as a as a a job lot, and obviously Macallan wanted to buy the Macallan back, but they they didn't want the rest of it. Uh, Glen Grant wanted the Glen Grant, 
but didn't yeah, want the true. rest of it. And um, and Yoon famously tells the story. Yoon Shan, who ended up buying it from the, the family of you know the. It was a fax at the time. They, he said, fax me over a list of casks. And, you know, 20 minutes later, the fax machine is still printing out <laughs> 1966 <laughs> Bowmore casks. Like, double-sided. And, he, and, and then and the Macallan casks then came through. And then the, uh, and they were sitting on a, a, a trip. Well, I think in fairness to you, and it was a, it was a huge risk. People, I mean, it's, in the late 90s, this wasn't a guarantee. This wasn't a sure thing. Yeah. You know, yep. there was no, yeah. I mean, my dad worked for Gordon McPhail and like people didn't want Rosebank or, <laughs> uh, in, or, or old Kalilas, 1960s Kalilas and things that they weren't in huge demand back then, you know. Um, even by the time I started at Loft Fine Whiskies, you know, we were selling, like you could get a Douglas Lang 32 year old Ardbeg for, 90 pounds, <laughs> 1968 Bunahan, you know, 85 pounds. It wasn't. Uh, what a world. Oh, what a different world. And yeah, I, so I, I, I don't want to derail you from the, the historical part, but this is actually one of the reasons I wanted to speak to you on the podcast is to give us some of that history as you've seen it, as you've lived it. Because, and this is kind of a recurring theme through One Nation Under Whiskey is here we sit at the very end, this episode will go out in the very beginning of 2022, where we've got this sense of the industry that was not the case 20 years ago. Like, it's insane where the industry has gone in just two decades. So I'm putting a pin in this. We're going to circle back to this line of questioning. But please continue with the, the Duncan Taylor and the, the, the Shandy story here. Yeah, so so Yoon, I mean, Yoon was 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 in the industry. He was kind of he'd been at his father was at Glendronach. Yoon started as a cooper at Glendronach when he was sixteen. His dad was the manager at Glendronach. Um, you know, Yoon had come through. He'd worked for teachers. Um, oh, yeah. You know, in in I think he'd been a ship, shipping clerk right the way through <laughs> to sales to, to everything, um, every aspect of the business, and at the time was. Um, again, was was selling blend to Taiwan and Russia and you know Venezuela and like markets like that. He had kind of uh, Scottish glory in a couple of of blend brands and um, and he got offered this stock and managed to 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 get the money together to buy to buy the Rosenbergs out and then you know set about uh, like all the trademarks on Black Bull had lapsed. I think actually Red Bull. Had, had subsequently registered the trademarks for every colour of bull, for every category, for every, you know, <laughs> trademark category. So, uh, you know, we actually, I think Moji got it. His wife was a, law, is a, was a lawyer and is a lawyer. Um, and she got a coexisting agreement with Red Bull. They were able to prove that Black Bull had been trademarked in New York and this was a historic brand, and Red Bull said, "Okay, we'll we'll we'll, we'll agree to uh, to coexist." Wow! Yeah, in the market. So, um, so yeah, you'd say about reviving the Duncan Taylor and and Black Bull brand, and um, and you know started off bottling some of those casks, and I mean that was always like I remember being at. at at Limburg Whiskey Festival in about 2004 with, with Springbank in, in, at Limburg in Germany. And, you know, I think at the time, Springbank had pretty much ran out of cask. The only whiskey we had was the 10-year-old. <laughs> you know, all the old stock, which I think probably comes back to where we stuck the pin, Jason, but all the, all the, <laughs> all the Springbank over 10 had been sold. Mm. So they only had a 10. And, and I remembered like Duncan Taylor were across from us and, just had like 20 <laughs> casks all from the, like, you know, again, 1966 Bowmore's, 1967 Highland Parks, 1968 Bunnehavens. And, you know, th their stand was like 10 people deep. And I'm, please try my spring <laughs> back 10. <laughs> Everyone's coming over. Why is that not 21? Why is that not 25? Like, all we have left. <laughs> 
Well, we we got another pin to throw in here then is that that relationship between producers and independent bottlers and how that flips and flops over the years. Because currently, IBs really can't get their hands on any Springbank and Springbank's sitting on all the good stuff. So again, yeah. something else that's changed within a couple of decades here. Well, I think, I mean, I think in in, in on that relationship between distillers and uh, and independent bottlers, like because I remember at the time it was out uh, Springbank and and Brook Laddie were just mm. kind of had just newly launched, and they, we had the same importer, Hansi Attish, um, mm-hmm. and I remember Jim McEwen was there, and he like he had a whole bunch of like early seventies Brook Laddies, and and mm-hmm. it was all cask samples. He was just there letting people taste them, <laughs> and uh, and Ewan walked over and was like, "That's my cask." That's my cask. That's my cask. That's my cask. <laughs> and I was like, Jim, you can't, you can't go taking, oh, you know, samples from my casks. They're, they're my casks. And Jim went, well, they're in my warehouse. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh gosh, that, I'm sure he didn't hesitate to say that at all. He had that one in the chamber. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine the types of words exchanged between Shandy and Jim McEwen. I, I can't imagine either fellow is the type to hold back. No, but it was, I don't think it, it wasn't taken, you know, <laughs> taken badly. I think, uh, yeah. I, again, it comes back, like it, none of this was a sure thing back then. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know if people newer to the industry realised that it was, you know, both Ewan and Jim had put their life savings and a whole load of debt and their reputations on the line. Sure. To buy to buy Brooke Laddie and to buy uh, to buy Duncan Taylor and you know it's yeah. Um, yeah it wasn't guaranteed that there was going to be success and and that whiskey companies were or old bottles were going to become worth what what they're selling for now. Um, you know <sighs> I mean I think. Yeah, so, I, I don't. I don't think any of us in the nine. Well, granted, in the nineties, you know, you and you and I and Jason were, were much younger and in, in different positions and and such. But I, I don't think those in the nineties had the crystal ball to see how crazy whiskey would get. You know, again, back to Jason's point. Over the past two decades, it, it's done this sort of hockey stick you know, of, of growth it is just rocketing up. And so, you know, when, when he's raising these funds and putting he, you and raising these funds and putting himself into debt to buy all these casks and, and, and to launch Duncan Taylor, was it with the idea that, um, he would regrow Black Bull as a brand? Did he see that other independent bottlers at that time, you know, Things were looking up for them at the time. Like, what was his plan to start with? Well, I think that yeah, the the, the blend business is um, is is really important to us. That's our that's our biggest you know seller. That's our volume. That's what Duncan Taylor does. I think you know the the single casks and the single malts are the the cherry on top. <laughs> Almost they're the they're the fun bit, and and they're actually like. They're the sweetener in deals because we're we're not a distiller, so we are buying from distilleries, and you know, as as you guys know, as you guys experience, distilleries will they want where they have surplus is always grain, yeah. <laughs> three year old grain whiskey you can get as <laughs> you know you get as much as you want, and if you buy a lot of three year old grain whiskey, then they'll throw in some some nice single malts to kind of sweeten the deal. <laughs> um, and so I think Ewan was always aware that you need that blend business as the volume driver, you know, and, and, uh, and, and then that'll get you access to, you know, to the malts and to the, the stuff where you can, you know, you can make a bit more money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, he was, he, he always, uh, in, had that blend history, but again, as I said, Scottish glory was, you know, he was before he bought Duncan Taylor. He was selling containers of blend to, you know, it was a. I mean, it was it was the, like the bagpiper on the label. It was the, <laughs> the, the, every the, the cheesy, 
<laughs> blend that, you know, you, we used to call them the flat cappers, you know, the, these um, bus tours, yeah. the, the bus drivers, and the, the, like they go for Christmas in Scotland, they come from Blackpool by the bus load and drive around Scotland and, and they have Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, you know, and all of them get to go home with a, a little miniature with a bagpiper on it and uh, from Edinburgh Woolen Mill or one of the, you know, that, that's uh -huh, the kind of, yeah, uh -huh, yeah. that's the, the kind of business that Ewan was doing with this, with this Scottish piper uh, or Scottish glory, sorry. <laughs> Did someone just shout in from another room there? I just saw you look over your shoulder to correct that. Like, oh no! It's no I was, I was, I was looking. Company. I've got a kind of in our office. We've got a little bar, and I was looking. I was like, that that wasn't the name of the whiskey. I was looking at the label to see what it was. Um, so yeah, so that I mean, you always intended to grow the blend business. That was always the the intention, and and that, and, and through that, um, replenish the 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 stocks of Duncan Taylor. I, again, you know, as we're seeing and as I went through at Springbank is, you know, part of the, the, the concern at that time was distilleries had been closed in the 90s for and the 80s. Mm -hmm. You know, there was huge gaps in production, which I think has also contributed to the, the pricing, the skyrocketing in pricing we're seeing is we're still in the middle of a 20-year production gap. Mm, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, you, yeah, good point. you can yeah, get good eight, point. nine, ten year olds, but, but you're not going to get a twenty or a twenty five year old. Yeah. yeah, and until that yep. stock ages through, you know, we're still we're still behind the curve. So, um, so I think Ewan could see, you know, could see that coming um, to a certain degree. We were starting at that time to, you know, whiskey tourism was starting to take off. Other than just the flat cappers, we were beginning to get. Um, Swedish, Germans, you know, a few Americans like the Plowed guys, you know, would uh -huh. Uh -huh. would would yep. be would be hanging out, um, and that was just when I was you know coming into uh, to start work at Log Fine Whiskies, and so, and it was that so, it was it was just on one more thing, it was that thing like my dad when I was a student, I remember my dad was working for Gordon McPhail and um, and late nineties, early to the like people started asking for whiskey tastings, you mm. know, like Ken at the, at the pot still, um, mm -hmm. the Bon Accord, you know, can you come in and do a tasting? And my dad was like, you know, whiskeys, you drink whiskey and you talk about <laughs> fishing or sport or, he's like, these people drink whiskey and talk about whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and when was that, Pete? 99, 98, okay. 99. Like, cause I remember, cause I lived above the Bon Accord Oh, interesting. I oh. lived on, I was at university, I lived on North Street. Um, yeah. And, and my, my landlord owned Mother, uh, Cafe Mother India. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so, my, so my dad would do these tastings and then he would, he would come up with all the open bottles and give them to me and my flatmates. <laughs> so we, we were drinking, you know, Kalilas and Rosebanks and um, uh, Linkwood and, you know, the kind of stuff that, that Gordon McPhail were bottling at the time. Yeah. Um, that was our that was our carry out <laughs> and then I remember like my, my landlord like if we if we paid our rent on time we, we would get a free Indian at, at, at cafe at Mother India <laughs> we'd get to go to the buffet and eat as much as we wanted so yeah that's the late 90s that was when we were, people started drinking whiskey and talking about whiskey as my dad would say so it, it's funny here you say just one more thing because you started talking exactly about what I wanted to hear from you. So, you know, we love Shandy and the Shandy story and the Duncan Taylor story. I feel like we've got it right to the point where you're about to join it. So why don't you tell us about Pete Curry? Like, give us give us that experience and hearing about the really fancy carry out above the Bon Accord um, <laughs> and, and kind of then where your whiskey story your whiskey life went from there mm. yeah i mean that was you know as i said my dad was with gordon mcphail and that was my kind of education into into single malt. he was he was a salesman west coast of scotland and and northern ireland was his mm. uh territory he always said he you know he used to sell to the most bombed pub in the world <laughs> like it's like it was it's been blown up 28 times or something um, and that's where you know like, 
he's actually like my, my dad and Raymond Armstrong are really good friends oh, uh, okay. of, of yeah. Bladna. Raymond and Florence park their camper van in our driveway every now and then. And uh, <laughs> my dad was that was because that was his area, like west yeah. coast of west coast of Glasgow, uh, west side of Glasgow, up to Fort William, down to Stranraer, and across to Northern Ireland. Mm. Um, and the Urquhart's, you know, David Urquhart in particular of, of Gordon McPhail had mm-hmm. had hired my dad, and um, so he, my dad used to be a fisherman, so he he you know knew the west coast, knew every pub, <laughs> 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 uh, and and did pretty well just selling whiskey and and you know timed it right again. People were starting to collect, people were starting to to buy like, it, but at that time it was. Like I would say, the most the most passionate collector, their 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 dream was to try one whiskey from every distillery. Mm. <laughs> you know that was the like people used to search for miniatures of Ladyburn, or mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't. You didn't have the the guys that I, like I only collect Springbank or I only collect Ardbeg or I only. It was it was I want to tick the list. Yeah, it was kind of how a lot of people started. So, um, so again, Gordon McPhail had those. Glen Vores and sure. as a whiskey salesman for my dad, it was quite easy because he he could help people tick the list, you know, sure. by, by sure. giving them the distilleries that nobody else could. Um, so yeah, that was I got into. I was studying at university and then graduated. Um, went went up, moved to Bangkok to become an English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> As one does. As one does. Yeah. <laughs> Wanting to travel, didn't have any money to travel, so I was like, yeah, I'll go and teach English. So I did that for about a year and a half and then moved back, uh, moved back to Scotland and was looking for a job. And my dad was in seeing Richard Johnson at Loch Fine Whiskies. Mm-hmm. And Richard said, I need a packing guy to pack up bottles and my dad said I know just the man <laughs> and that was me and went into work you know started working at at, at Loch Fine Whiskies um, which I, I loved I mean really it was the best job in the world yeah because Richard was awesome uh, you know playing Jules Holland and at, at full volume and we're all just dancing around the shop and you know whiskey bottles everywhere uh-huh, kind of uh-huh, crammed in uh-huh. um i was you know he, he his website was just taken off back then like he was still writing the remember the scotch whiskey review yep mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. He, i mean it was all printed and posted it was it wasn't a blog or a or an online yep. thing it was like we packed it up we stuck stamps on it we took it to the post office and we you know and that was i, I mean i thought I, I loved it i loved everything about working in that shop um it was it was buzzing you know the we were packing bottles we were sending bottles all over the world we, you know to all the all the collectors all the people you know uh a lot of the plowed guys i can still remember addresses you know because <laughs> you'd be like oh, you know i uh, I want a Glen Roth is nineteen sixty eight. Is that this cast number? Is it this batch? What strength is it at? What's which Springbank twenty one have you got? Um, and yeah, just great fun. Really loved it. And you got you know everybody called in on their way to Isla, so you got the good and the great of the whiskey industry. You know the, the mm-hmm. Charlie McLean's and Dave Brooms and um, you know the. Uh, Turnbull Hutton was was one that was always in from from Diageo and mm. the Langs, the mm-hmm. Urquharts, the you know uh, the Grants. Everybody came in yeah. on their way past. Everyone called in, um, and 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 then really cool people. You know, I mean, one of my favourites was just it was always Isla Festival when like Nadi Fiore and um, you know Valentino Zagatti and. <laughs> These guys would all come in. The Italians would appear, and then the uh, the Swedes, you know. I love the, it. The, I absolutely the, love it. Was that ever Richard's intention? Did 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 Richard already live? And I always get it. I know there's Inveruri and Inverary, and I always get it wrong uh, for where Loch Fine is, the the town of Loch Fine. Yeah, it's in, in, in Inverary on Inverary. Yeah. 
Yeah. So did he did he live in Inverary and just happened to set up the shop and it's just sheer happenstance that it was the route to Isla and all the things that came from that? Richard, I, I, I mean, I got together with Richard for a beer in the summer. I was back in Scotland and, we, you know, we, we met at Fine Ales and had a picnic, <laughs> nice. and a picnic and a pint, which was great, and we're kind of catching up. Um, Richard was a fish farmer or... As one newspaper, Richard Johnson, there was an edit in a, in a newspaper, or maybe it was a whiskey book or something, and somebody, Richard Johnson is a fish. <laughs> they, they dropped the far, the far, far, far. <laughs> Richard Johnson is a fish. <laughs> so, yeah, Richard and, and, and Lindsay had, um, he'd been a fish farmer and, and was looking for something to do, and he, he wanted something that was... Scottish that you could sell in Inverary, but didn't have a sell by date. That was his unbelievable. That was his stipulation. I want something Scottish to sell, but don't want a sell by date. Wow. Uh, and, and I think he started off in uh, uh, on Loch Lomond in, in one of the, the little shopping mall bits there near at, at Luss or Tarbet or one of them, and, okay. and then oh, okay. and then got the shop on the main street in Inverary. Um, hmm. But again, that you know you you were. I think the classic malts cruise was going, but the Isla Festival hadn't really started when, when he started the shop. Yeah. Um, you know, he was, I guess him and Sekinder were probably about the same time, pretty much oh, starting yeah. off and, there you go. And, yep. and opening the shops and then starting with the websites. And I mean, I remember sure. like, he, he told me that the black and white of Loch Fine Whiskies, the town of Inverary is black and white, but it was also for ease of loading the website. <laughs> Like that's, that's how, fantastic. <laughs> that's how slow it was, and he just had these lists of of single malts, and he wanted yeah. people to be able to download it. Or uh, you, on, yeah, on back, back in 1999, a friend of mine said, "I, I want to get you a bottle for your 25th birthday." And I said, oh, "That that's very kind of you." I was just getting into single malts at that time, and I remember going through the Loch Fine price sheet. That was it was narrow. It was probably maybe five yeah, inches was, across, was right? And you kind of unfurled it. It was almost like a map. Um, and I remember going through that and pricing. And I, and I think I know I got a twenty-five-year-old Dal Ewan. I know that. And I think it might have cost my friend fifty pounds, sixty pounds. Was that a sig- that, probably a, probably a signatory. Um. I th- you're it? probably right on that. I can't quite and picture it in my head, but you're probably right. Yeah. But yeah, cheapest cheapest chips. It was a great little peppery Dal Ewan, and and I remember you know Michael Jackson writing Dal Ewan book at bedtime material. I was like, oh, that's right up my alley. That'll work just fine. So um, yeah, yeah. I remember I remember those price sheets, and so the black and white for an easily loadable website would have even been after that for me. That would have been into the. 2000, 2001s kind of thing. We really yeah, were living I mean, in the future, Pete. Let's see. We used to we used to post them out all <laughs> all of those price lists and and the, you know the Scotch Whiskey Review was was quarterly um, and yeah, I mean it was it was cutting. It, you know, it was mm-hmm. it was I guess the sponge of its time. <laughs> <laughs> if, if that's fair to say, you know, and, and there was there was some bits like. And, but yeah, we what a laugh we used to have just just preparing it, and there was some things that we that we never had the balls to put in. But <laughs> like I remember, Richard always wanted to do a keeper's wife's <laughs> section, <laughs> and uh, I always thought that would have been pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the yeah. chuckles in a back room, eh? The chuckles. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. It was just it was just a laugh. It was, you know, putting it together and, and, and again Richard did most of it and there was little bits of tattle that meant nothing to anybody. <laughs> you know, I mean maybe maybe like twenty people actually got the references or knew, but but that was what was so cool about it, you know? <laughs> So, so a, bit then, like, a, a bit like the sponge. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, very very so, niche. So, so if you, you were digging that life and having fun as a, as a young man, then you, but you'd still moved on. Why did you move on and, and where did you go from there? Yeah, I'd been, I was there a couple of years and then 
Um, my dad again saw an advert for a job at Janie Mitchell at Springbank. Mm-hmm. Um, Ewan Mitchell had left Springbank and gone to Aaron. Uh, and his oh, job- you didn't drive him out. I, I thought that's how the story <laughs> went. Okay, all right. Uh, no, he no, he'd left before. I mean, you again it was an, everyone came into Love Fine Whiskey, so I knew you and just yeah. from him popping in and out. Um, sure. And so yeah, I, I sent off my CV and um, and then forgot all about it. And I went on a trip to as was, was a stag do to Barcelona. And we were all in Barcelona in our kilts on a stag do. Scotland were playing football, went to this Scottish pub, watched the football, having pints, and got talking to this girl. And it was like, Scottish girl, I said, where are you from? She said, oh, I'm, from, I'm from Campbelltown. I said, oh, you'll know Springbank. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I actually work for Springbank. And I was like, oh, no, wait, I, I work for Lothine Whiskies. Um, and she's like, have you applied for a job with us? This was Kate, right? Oh my goodness! Oh, Kate Watt. Okay, Kate Watt. Yeah, 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 yeah. So okay. Kate's like, "Have you applied for a job?" And I was, and I was like, "I did. Yeah, I sent my CV." And she's like, "Did you get a letter?" I was like, "No, I haven't." Does that mean I've not got the job? And she's like, "I, I think we sent you a letter." And so then my dad phoned me the next day, yeah, and said, "There's a letter come in. It's got Springbank, you know, on the envelope." Yeah, and yeah. So I went down for the interview a week later, um, oh and then a couple goodness. of weeks after that, they wrote to me and said, you, you got a job, do you want to move down to Campbelltown? And That's insane, absolutely mental. You start work, um, 4th of January, two, 5th, 5th of January 2004, it's 6 o'clock in the morning, I started in the malt floors. Ah. Um, Frank put me straight in there, and I did three months of malting, and then mashing, distilling, you know, worked my way right through. Sure. Um, as a shift worker, learned, learned yeah. the process and, uh, and that was it. But just very quickly, all <laughs> happened. So I'm still was, reeling from you just bumping into Kate in a Scottish bar in Barcelona. It's, we talk I'm, about the industry being small and we talk about Scotland being small, but come on, that's a bar in Barcelona. Come on. <laughs> The the other the other thing to be reeling about is is so far the forms of communication that's been in discussion are fax machines and letters. I know. It shows you, it shows you how long it was. And it's funny. I've always thought about you being a young man in the industry, Pete. These these forms of communication are suggesting otherwise. That's. I am. I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm a long way from my. Uh, my Young Ambassador of the Year Award. <laughs> uh, so, so you're 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 at Springbank, and and so, what were you doing at Springbank, and how long did you stay there before you you moved on to other pastures? Well, I I mean, so during my interview, I mean, I I did the classic like, I know there will be other people applying for jobs and I'm sure they're much more qualified than me but I'm cheaper and I'll work harder (laughs) (laughs) that was that was my pitch basically like pay me less and so so they were they they were the job was a sales and marketing director I mean it was it was somebody to come in as Kate's boss which you had been and and I basically said like I'll do it cheap and I guess they liked me, and they they said, right. Well, what we'll what we'll do is we'll we'll put you and Kate together, and if you guys do a good job, then we won't bother. And if you don't, then we'll we'll just hire somebody above you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, it was like sales and marketing. It was it was attending events. You know, Kate did obviously with her languages. She, you know, Italian and mm-hmm. French and Spanish. So she was covering those markets, and I was doing, you know, the U.S. and Germany, Scandinavia. Um, but it also, like, very quickly became apparent that they had nothing to sell. They had no stock to sell. <laughs> like, I think the, I think the twenty one sold out just that, just just as I started, and and so the, all they had was the ten. <laughs> so, so, so in real terms, and I know we can 
we can sit here and we, and we can chuckle about that and, and make light of it. What did you do in the face of that? What is the answer as the guy who's, who's doing sales and marketing with, with Springbank? How do you pitch that to international markets? And, and what's happening behind the scenes at the distillery? <laughs> Obviously, they're just making whiskey every day uh, that they possibly can. There's, probably, there's not much more you can do beyond that. But for you as the, the face of it, going out and speaking to markets and Kate as well, what, what are you delivering to markets? I mean, it, it was really like, I mean, basically we allocated the cases at the start of the year and it was, you know, okay, 500 cases to France, 500 cases to Japan, you know, a thousand cases to America. And, and so, so we pretty, it was just allocating and then going out and doing a bit of um, sales support. They had, I mean, Frank had been there. They, so they'd been closed in the 80s, in and out of production in the 90s. Um, mm-hmm. Frank McHardy had come back and I think Frank came back in 95, 96. He'd re-racked all the casks. I think the, you know, the quality of the oak wasn't great and Frank had re-racked them all into, into better quality. And so this was the 2004 I came. So we were just getting into the stuff that Frank had actually distilled and, and rather than the, the, the stop start nature. So they'd been working pretty much flat out since since Frank came back. Um, mm. And so th- we had a 10 year old and then we had some, some wood expressions, you know, the, the, the Marsala wood, the Madeira mm. wood, oh, the yeah, Tokai yeah. wood. The, uh-huh. um, Remember them very well, very well. Mm-hmm. All Drinking of those them in and, and more. And then some, some long row. Frank had done hazel burn, so we were starting to get like eight, eight year old hazel burn coming on. Um, but the at that time. Hazel burn in Sauterne, that, that eight year old. Yeah. I, I, guarantee i've gone through 12 bottles of that just magical stuff sorry continue no no so that was it we, we, we had a we had a, a wall painted black with a calendar on it for the next 10 years worth of releases and, and it was like you know we're going to release a wood expression in march and we're going to do a long row in october and we've got three thousand cases and we've got five thousand cases and and, and that was for the next 10 years. Gosh. Uh, you know, and you did, your, you did your tours and you did your... Uh, the whiskey clubs were just starting to become, I think. Sweden was probably at the forefront of... They were the first one to actually, you know... I think in Sweden, if two people get together on a Friday night for a pint, after the second week of doing that, they have to form a club and have a secretary <laughs> and get a hat and a T-shirt. <laughs> It, it gets formal real fast. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it always. I, I remember doing in Borlanga in Sweden, doing a, a the Springbank Millennium, the 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, and they had three sets. They had like two hundred people there for a for a, a tasting um, of Springbanks, and I remember the, the table I was on. I was the speaker. That's what I was talking about. The table I was on for for dinner. The, this man turns to me very seriously. He says, "Have you heard?" There is a, a bourbon club started in Borlanga. And I said, Oh, that's that's terrible. Who, who's, who's the bourbon club? It's that table over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, it was, it was like that scene in Monty Python, you know, it was like the popular people's front of Judea. They're like, Sp- splitters! <laughs> Throwing things at the bourbon club. <laughs> <laughs> the guys at the bourbon club hello <laughs> uh, so, so yeah I mean that was that was it we did we kind of uh, we also I mean Kate and I, I, I we got the Springbank Society going started doing the society bottles oh, we got the open yeah, day yeah. going we 2004 they opened Glengyle mm, so yep. I mean I was lucky enough to fill the first cask at, at Glengyle um, oh nice. wow so wow. Campbelltown was, you know, was starting to come back up again. I would say it'd been in a pretty dark place, yeah. Um, and it was, it was definitely becoming more. Uh, there was a lot of improvement happening in the in the town at the time, and and you know we would just get the like, like you know price imports would bring over Henry Price would bring over Brett and Monique, mm-hmm. you know yeah. uh, Monique Houston and Brett from Binnies and. The K&L guys and 
you know, big Steve Fox, and they'd all come over. Yeah. And so springtime, we'd, we'd, we'd be, that was the start of what became the whiskey school. Ah, was probably uh, groups from America okay. coming over and spending a week working. And then, you know, Frank said, well, I can, I can write an itinerary and we can make an exam and we can actually make this a thing. But it was, to start off with, it was just trade, you know, people coming over and wanted to learn and we'd, we'd put them to work because we were malting and distilling and filling casks and uh, and it was like yeah sure you want to shovel barley all right <laughs> here's your shovel yeah <laughs> see you in eight and, hours and, and you you charged people not to do not back then not you. back then oh, was, oh not back then oh, was, okay that's what i'm saying it was yeah i wasn't charging brett a thousand dollars to come and shovel barley <laughs> And then go um, back and sell Springbank and Long Row. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but that's what it morphed into. I, I mean, yeah, they, yeah, they were charging yeah. people to, um, you know, to stay for a week in Campbelltown, and uh, so, the B&Bs B and were happy, the hotels were happy. Yeah, it, and, and again, and you alluded to this earlier, but the, the rise of whiskey tourism in Campbelltown, yeah. getting some of that off the back of the brands connected to Springbank. Um, I, I'm curious, did you leave first or did Kate leave first? I want to know who ran whom out of town. <laughs> Kate, Kate left first. Kate, uh -huh. Guilty, got okay, the, Pete. Kate got the Glenn Farkless job. So yeah. that's big money. I think that's way more money than... <laughs> <laughs> is, is George Grant known for making it rain? Oh it? yeah, <laughs> relocation <laughs> fee to to Dufton. Uh, you know. <laughs> and, and then with without Kate, how much longer were you there uh, after Kate moved on to Glenfarclas? Um Well, I mean that was like I'm trying to think. Jenny Carlson came in, mm -hmm. Ronald yeah. came in, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Donald Cole will work there. Uh, I'm trying to think who else came through. You know, there was um, I, either Grant, obviously, in the Caddenhead shop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the, so because you had the Caddenhead shop, we had the, we opened the kind of tasting room bit. You know, we were doing the tours. We had the whiskey school, um, mm -hmm. so it became a, a a pretty cool little hub. There was always visitors. There was always people about. You were always getting called on, like. We need to, you know, can you do a tour this afternoon? We've got a group coming in. Um, it was really fun. It was, re I, I loved it. I loved my time at Springbank. I loved the distillery. I loved the people. You know, the job was cool. You felt like um, th they gave you responsibility and let you, like, I mean, maybe they were giving you the rope to hang ourselves. I don't know. But, they, <laughs> but, but, but you know, they, they gave us the freedom to go and, you know, and, and grow these businesses. And let's say Caddenheads had obviously been there a long time, but the tasting room was new. And um, I just, it, I think everybody there had a real feeling of of being allowed to take responsibility mm -hmm. and and run with it, you know. And that's quite a hard thing to put in a team hmm. when you're not, mm -hmm. but, but, but the, the results are fantastic. When you're not having to motivate people, people are taking responsibility for themselves. Um, it, yeah, it was a really cool time to be... Um, to be there and, and to see things grow and to see it, I mean, doing so well now with um, with Glengyle and like, which is great juice, you know, I mean, those Kilkerrans. Uh, mm -hmm. yep. Frank, turns out, did know a little bit about making whiskey. <laughs> 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 and that's the other thing, working with him, I mean, working with Frank was, you, you know, I, I get... Not annoyed, but you know, they, everyone's a master distiller these days. You know, whereas mm -hmm. when I came mm -hmm. through, you you kind of you had to do your time, and and you know you you hoped by the time you got to like your sixties that you'd be a master distiller. But now they're just <laughs> you know they're brandishing these titles around like uh, like like crazy. So. <laughs> See now, now you're trying to get into my memory as the grumpy old man of whiskey. This is what I like, right? I, I can, <laughs> Pete, Pete Curry, no longer the young man of whiskey. He's the grumpy old man of whiskey. I can live with that. <laughs> that I can remember easily. Jaded and tired. And <laughs> He's seen it all. I've uh, been looking at these Ian Gray paintings for twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um, <laughs> so, so here, so here we are again. You're in a position that that you've loved, you've enjoyed, and yet you moved on from it. So, what took you up north? Assuming you left Springbank to take on the Duncan Taylor role. Yeah, I think there's 
there's a certain point, again, spring back family owned companies. Um, I guess you just get the, the feeling that you're maybe treading water until a member of the family comes in that's going to take over. Like, do you know what I mean? You can only, yeah. you can yeah. only go so far. And, I, and I, I loved working there. I loved working with them. And, and, um, but the distillery is very, and, and rightly so, they have done what they need to do sur to survive for a, you know, since 1828. Mm -hmm. They have made the right decisions. Like, there's no, you know, mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. when they've gone in and out of production, Sometimes it's counterintuitive. I think it's, you know, Headley Wright is a very, very intelligent man and and has always zigged when everybody else has zagged. I think. I mean, like when when he remember he put Springbank on mothballs for a couple of years in the middle of the boom. You know, early two thousands. It was or, or two thousand and six. I think two thousand and seven. Yeah. Oh really? He, moth, he mothballed the distillery that. because the price of oil was really high. The price of barley. The price of casks. And he had always made whiskey when nobody else was making whiskey. Hmm. That, like he went against the trends all hmm. the time. Um, so he was like, wild. you know, that, that was the way he's run his business and, and that business has survived a long, long time. So um, hmm. he's obviously right in what he does, but it, it, it just, it became, you know, again, it was sales prevention. There wasn't, we weren't really selling uh, or we had no, need everything was mapped out on that wall and everything was mapped out on a spreadsheet who would get what and there was no you know you were just sitting essentially saying no to people a lot of the time like oh Sikinder Ran used, to, used yes. to hang up on me like, who did Sikinder ah. would phone like can, you know can I get a pallet of 21 year olds no you can have a case and then he'd phone back can I get a pallet of 21 year old no you can have a case and then the phone would go again and I'd hear Kate saying <laughs> Hi, Sikinder. No, we don't have any left. You better speak to Pete. You know, and then Frank's phone would go. I'm sorry, Sikinder, we don't have any. You know, <laughs> it was like you can only have a case. That's all we've. That's all we've got. Wow. Wow. I think I did. I, I remember I did give him a bit more in return. And again, this shows you in return for a, a Karazawa sixty-seven, the tenth anniversary whiskey exchange one. Uh -huh. I think it was two hundred and fifteen pounds, mm. and I said, "Right, I'll I'll give you a couple of extra cases of twenty-one year old if you give me a discount on the Karazawa." <laughs> so he gave me it for a hundred and ninety-five or something. <laughs> <laughs> a deep, deep, <laughs> deep discount on that one. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, you made that worth your time. <laughs> so again, Japanese whiskies. Nobody really, yeah. nobody knew back then. You know no that these. You know, you, you kind of couldn't, almost couldn't give it away. Um, Hirsch as well. I mean, Henry Price had that had all that old Stitzel Weller. Uh, oh, yeah, the, like under the, the sixteen-year-old the age Hirsch label, and yeah. you know, you were having you beg people to to take it. Like it, it that, again, it wasn't it wasn't a sure thing. Like I said before, uh, that, that this market would go the way it's gone. So, um, so yeah, that was the. 2012, I left. I left Springbank. Okay. Um, okay. And Ewan offered me to to move out to LA. So I had a oh, two okay. year old at the time. Matilda was two, and he said, "Do you want to?" And it was funny. We we'd, we'd taken when she was like nine months. I was over at Whiskey Fest in San Francisco, and mm -hmm. my wife and daughter came, and we got uh, one of those RVs, one of those. Uh, to cruise America, uh -huh, uh -huh. and we, we and we went to Yosemite, and we went, you know, with a with a nine month old, we did a few of the national parks, and like I remember with the fire, we had the fire lit, we're sitting there, and and my wife said to me like, oh, this, imagine we could, you know, find a way to come and live here for, even just for a year or two, and 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 experience something different, and then, like, a year later, I got offered <laughs> a, a job, and do you want to move to California? So we kind of thought, yeah, like you know, it'll be. It'll be a couple of years. We'll go and we'll go and experience it, and then we'll come home. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, thankfully, my parents, my wife's parents, everybody's healthy and fit, and you know, so we're just kind of, uh huh, kind of winging it at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, you know, not to get maudlin, but but I remember the exact thing. I, I moved over here actually 
this is 20 years almost to the day uh, that, that we're that we're talking that I moved to the US and my parents were fine fettle and go to America and make your way and you know have, have a ton of fun over there and then a te- what 10 years later 15 years later when they do inevitably get older and you're overseas and it, it gets a wee bit more complicated but when they're in good health and you're over here it's it's a lot of fun to be had and not too many people to be worried about back at home. Yeah, I think, I mean, what the dream has always been to, you know, to afford a place here and a place in Scotland. Um, you know, I could do end of May to September mm. in, Sco- in Scotland and, <laughs> you know, see all, this, all the distributors that come and visit. I could, you know, hang out with, with Brett binnies or you know the buyers and and do some business maybe sell some casks Mm -hmm. and then come back here in september (laughs) and do over over winter in california Um, i like the the thought i like the thought that you just want to go back to scotland for midgey season like that's really that's a high level of commitment there I, i saw that some of the wind in that storm that, that hit a couple of days ago. And yeah. I, I mean, I, it just goes right through you. You know that? <laughs> the midges I can handle. It's also in, in, L, in LA, it's avoiding fire season. And, and mm, the, mozzies, mm-hmm. the mozzies are pretty big out here as well. Very um, true, very true. So, but, but you, like, you know, you can, you can get a bunch of cask sales in the pipeline, a bunch of retailers on board, and, and then come back knowing that you've got, you know, you've got business ready to go until the end of the year. So yeah, um, sounds smart. That's, that's the dream. That's what I'm working towards. <laughs> you know, uh, With a pandemic out of the way. Well, yeah, current, <laughs> current variant. <laughs> way to bring the mood down, Jason. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about my parents dying. I'm talking about the pandemic. I'm, you know Jason's having a good time when he moves on to the modelling topics. Like, that really seals the deal for me. Like, this was a real conversation. I had a blast. Yeah, you, you, we've got to wallow in it. I think the, the Scots, we definitely lean into uh, depression. You know, we're none of this over-optimistic American enthusiasm. I think somebody once said that that was all the, you know, during the, the Highland clearances and things, all the, all the positive Scots left for the new world. And all the negative ones stayed in Scotland and bred with other negative Scots, like pessimistic. Uh, you know? It makes perfect sense. Makes sense. And, I, I, and a I, lifetime I, as a Scotland football fan as well <laughs> will we'll definitely do that to you. Right. I, no, I said that to various people around about the time of the, the last independence vote. They were like, do you think Scotland will vote independent? I said, no, Scots have always gone with the bird in the hand. Even if it's dead and covered in its own shit, like you go with the bird in the hand rather than the optimism of yeah. what could be. And, and folk went, well, better the devil you know. Like, at least you know where you stand with a dead shit covered bird in your hand. At least you know where you stand. Yeah. It was prophetic. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, it was the optimism that brought me here. Definitely, that, that's the one thing I do love, you know, that kind of unbridled American enthusiasm for everything (laughs) especially in california jason gets on me all the time he's like you're too optimistic this nope this isn't gonna work out you're being too optimistic (laughs) and i claim i'm I'm being realistic but he 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 does not agree with me it's true ever it's true i shake my head at the optimism all the time all the time yeah it's a it's a very uh a very American thing, you know. It's it's just that belief is that, that anything can happen, and you do feel it. I think being out here, and you know, I, I do love it. I do love, like even, you know, schlepping the streets of New York with a bag of samples. There's something, you know, you feel like you're you're living the American dream. Like this is <laughs> yes, th- th- this yes, is this is yeah. just the scene in the movie where I'm working hard. <laughs> To lead to the scene in the movie where I'm old and rich. I mean, <laughs> like, do you know? Do you know what I mean? It feels like you're part of that. Um, one, yeah, yeah. Oh, one, one hundred percent. Just, just really quickly. I remember in 2017 when we decided to 
not break from online, exclusive online sales, but just add retail sales on top of what we were doing with our own online bottlings. And Jason and I were were in New York. We're meeting with our new distributor, Skernick, there. And we're we're hitting stores and we're stopping for a pint, then hitting stores and then stopping for a pint. And <laughs> and, and even Jason, in, in, a, in a very rare moment, said, if we could make it here, we could make it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, schlepping, absolutely. Yeah, it you know, feels great. <laughs> it's a, it's, it, you know, when you're running from uh, from Park Avenue to Astor to, I mean, it's, it's all yeah. the, and, and, and it, honestly, there's no other substitute for it. That, you know, you, you start at the top of Third Avenue and you just work your way down and the next day you start at the top of Fourth Avenue and you work your way down. It's... Uh, <laughs> and it's something I love, and, and and that kind of has been a very cool part of being out here. There is that kind of belief, whereas you know, as you're saying in Scotland, there is a, a reticence to to overegging it. Which, again, in fairness, I think you know, conservativeness. They, they you know, mm-hmm. they they play it safe. Um, and I think again, coming back to whiskey, with when you're working in a 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 year business plan, when you know you're making stuff that you'll never, you know, that will be sold long mm. after you're dead, it's, it probably is better to be a bit conservative than, <laughs> than, uh, than, than, than going back to the whiskey lock days that we, that, that we all talk about, you know, in the, in the 70s when there was just so much overproduction. Yeah. that there was a massive surplus and, and kind of nobody was buying. I don't think we're going to go back to those days again, but, um, you know, I, I, bec- because we've got this production gap, I th- it'll certainly be another 20 years before before there's a lock. Um, hmm. It's good hearing hearing things like that. I'm, I'm curious for you, coming over here in 2012, obviously you've, you've been working the US market and you were doing the, the Springbank and the, the Mitchell Brands thing over here. Then you came over to do the Duncan Taylor thing, and, and now here you are in importation. What have you seen with the industry across the US in the time you've been coming over here and in the time you've lived here? Obviously, the technology, obviously, you know, the, the Facebook and mm. blogs and the, the rise in that community. I mean, I, I get, I think most, most people that come over and say they know me, it's from touring Ralphie around Springbank. I did a Ralphie tour. <laughs> uh, and Ralphie, he had a flip. Like it, it was a camera that had a USB slot and, and you, it had a 10 minute max and then you, you plugged it into your USB and it, 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 lo- you know, it downloaded it the video over, yeah. straight across. Yeah. And Ralphie was convinced that, you know, that, that YouTube TV was going to be the next big thing, which it pretty much is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, uh-huh. But he was convinced that they were going to pay him vast sums of money to have a TV channel on YouTube TV, which maybe hasn't quite come to the... I, I mean, I guess it's Amazon now or, or content creators. Right. So that's been a huge thing. I think that the changes in technology and... Um, and how it's influenced and how it's moved. I've never moved beyond Facebook, but I know, you know, <laughs> Instagram and Twitter and, you know, the, there's all these little sub uh, clans, I guess you could call them, in, in, in different places and there's some overlap in them. And um, mm. So that's been pretty cool. I mean, whiskey-wise, I guess, you know, the rise of Japanese, that kind of came out of nowhere. Um, then the rise of bourbon, Mm. Yeah, right. The rise of bourbon in its own country. <laughs> which, which again, I think is... Uh, I don't think they've really affected Scotch. I don't think the Scotch sales have dropped. Or I mean, I mean they've carried on growing, but it's, it's kind of like the, um, the, noisy, the noisiest kid. The kid sure. <laughs> so sure. Gets the most attention, you know. They, 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 yeah. They're making lots of noise. Um, but I think it's kind of... We're all just in a... A, a kind of rising tide raising all boats at the moment and, and it has been for the last 10 years I would say the the craft beer thing 
was really interesting to me seeing the rise in these in these craft breweries and um and that i think ultimately bodes well for scotch i think the rise in bourbon bodes well for scotch i think all of these people will, will try i mean I, I listened to your podcast i know josh is fighting that corner for <laughs> for scotch amongst the noise of bourbon but i, I think ultimately Trying. you know people's palates will lead them to single malts i i, I believe that mm -hmm. entirely and mm -hmm. i think we're in a yeah you know, there's been that shift from, and I, I put that down to craft beer where, again, it's, you've lost that brand loyalty. People want to taste as much as they can and they want to try everything, you know, whereas I think maybe before it was, I'm a Macallan guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a Highland Park guy. I only drink Scapa or whatever your <laughs> preference was. Whereas nowadays it's like, I, I want to try every cask of every, you know, um, different distillery and so if people are consuming like that then it, there's, there's plenty of room for everybody and all the world whiskies that are coming in and um, yeah I think it's, yeah. It's, it's an awesome time to to be in this industry and uh, yeah I think I think speci especially in the US as well and I, and I only say this from talking with those outside of the US who, who are not experiencing the same thing same thing as what I'm about to say is in the U.S. there's a push for people that, there are people that are just interested in trying new things oh is that a Welsh whiskey? that sounds cool let me try that that's an Indian whiskey? let me try that that sounds cool where in another country there's a bit of a hesitancy where there's oh it's not scotch whiskey well hmm, all right, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's not so Maybe it's not so good. So, so, so to you know, to your point, I I think that bodes well, continues to bode well for Scotch whiskey, in that those that are drinking whiskey in general are interested in trying other things and won't just say no, to say no, you know. Yeah, um, you know, I think the the whole um, Cavalan coming on and doing, you know, th th there is, it, it gets attributed again to, to you know, whether it's a, a Malt Maniacs or, or Jim Murray, or I mean, everyone's trying to claim credit for the rise of Japanese whiskey, you know, <laughs> ultimately it was the quality of Japanese whiskey that, that brought about the rise of Japanese whiskey, you know, so, but again, it's, it, it, it's thinking more as a global perspective, I think there is still... 85% of the market is blends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, of the single malts, Glenfiddich and Glenlivet, I think, are pretty much like 8% of single malt, 9% of single malt sales, and everybody else is crammed into this tiny little 3%. Like, I remember somebody at Edrington telling me that Highland Park was less than 1% of their business. Highland Park. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So, yeah. so we're, we are tiny, like really, really, really tiny compared yeah. to, you know, and, and so there's so much room that can be uh, for, for growth and, and as people are happier to spend a bit more. And I mean, I remember when we put Springbank over $50 in the US, there was uproar. Springbank 10 went from 49 to 55 and there was absolute pandemonium. People, you'll never sell a single malt, a 10 year old single malt for over $50, you know, and then, and then pretty quickly Ardbeg jumped over 50 and then everybody else, mm -hmm. you know, started passing us. So, you know, you just, uh, that's the thing We're, we, we are a really small part of, of a very big industry and a, and a kind of global perspective. And, um, and I think on a, on a local perspective, you know, as, as, Again, Cavalan gets more interested. Taiwan, obviously, a big single malt market. Um, you know, distilleries like, you know, Patrick Zudam in, in Holland and, and mm. Millstone. It yeah. complements imported, you know, Scotch or American whiskey or, or whatever. I, I, you know, I think they, they all complement. It, it gives it a relevance having a local distillery and, and gives you a bit of a, you know, like you feel part of, of the industry. It doesn't seem so remote if there's somebody mm. there in local. Mm. So I think it's cool. I, th I think it's great. Um, 
Yeah. I, I had a question for you. You know, as you're talking about blends there, and we're talking about these two decades. We're talking about Black Bull and obviously an award winning blend with, you know, some great age statements on it as well. Have you seen a change in how the market has responded to blended whiskey? Where for us in the single cask side of the industry, there's been a lot of poo pooing of blends. But then there's talk about, well, John Glazer and what Compass Box do, they've kind of legitimized it. You've been there for a while with, with Black Bull. How's the reception to that? And have people become more receptive to it as some of that poo-poo has kind of died away a little bit? I, I mean, in our experience, the blend has always been um, the, the bulk of sales. And, and that's, uh, you know... Again, I think the child that makes the most noise is the one that gets all the attention, <laughs> and that's that's single cast cast and single malts. But, mm, but yeah. realistically, the you know the majority <laughs> of the business, the majority of what people are buying, is blended. So yeah, if you have a yeah. good a good quality blended um, proposition, then uh, and and I think for us, you know, bottling at higher proof, bottling at hundred proof, non chill filtered, no artificial colouring. That kind of sets us apart in that blend category. So with something like Black Bull 12, we are making what, what we call a malt drinker's mm -hmm. blend. Mm -hmm. It is higher proof. It's got, you know, it's got a lot of sherry cask in there. And yeah, and the, and the reception it gets is, is awesome. Like everybody loves it. And you do, you know, look at Compass Box with absolute admiration for what they do. And, you know, the, their packaging is spectacular and, you know, they they've kind of gone that. How can I put this? Like the, <laughs> like I love watching you being careful. This is I know, well, it's, it, I'm not really. I mean, I think it's 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 the Brooke Laddie or Brewdog school of marketing. You know, you mm -hmm. you, you launch a product, you create a a, contra a controversy, try and get this, the SWA to write you a letter, cease and desist, and then uh, and then sell out of bottles on the back of a manufactured controversy, <laughs> you know, like it's that, that school of, of, um, of marketing. And, uh, we've never really gone that route. It's just, it's just, you know, black bill, good quality, yeah. solid blended whiskey and, and let it, you know, sell it on its own, on its own merits rather than, you know, a nice label or a, or a, Controversial, even though it has a lovely label. Yeah, it does, but but that's not you know you're not spending the the money on fancy packaging or it's just like let the let the juice talk for itself. Mm -hmm. um, yep. I, I'm impressed you chose to put a bagpiper on the label. I thought that was a big bold move. <laughs> <laughs> the bagpiper got retired. He 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 stepped down. I think it's now on Scottish Glory. It's a it's very it's like a. Lion rampant. It's very Game of Thrones esque. Looks like ah, uh, okay, House yeah. Baratheon or something. It's you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, but yes, I'm, I was just curious. Have you ever had a Black Bull with Red Bull? <sighs> no, That's my question. <laughs> no, I'm not an energy drink. <laughs> just curious. Kind of yeah, I, I only mix the forty year old with Red Bull. Right, it makes it makes sense. Yeah, oh, it's, yeah. it complements the ice the best. It does. I'm yeah. trying to think how the colors would work. Would that then be a brown bowl in the end? The black and the red. If you Purple? mix a black and red, it'd be a Highland cow. I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've just named it. You could now walk into a bar and ask for a Highland oh, cow, and that's, that's a black black bull forty with red bull. I'll be expecting a call from David Sturk and Mark Watt about their next. Uh, <laughs> Their next series of bottlings. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so j just so you're, you're both aware, I I have a dentist appointment in in twenty minutes. Okay. Um, Sorry to hear that. that. That I have to head out to. So, there's so many questions that I that I have for you, and 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 I think it's kind of evident we're we're going to need a second conversation with you. But the first question that I had for you. Before. He's like no chance. There's no. There's no second. No, ha happy to come back. <laughs> One and done. <laughs> the first question I have for you is, who who comes to a blend like Black Bull? Is it 
Is it malt drinkers that come to Black Bull? Is it blend drinkers that come to Black Bull? And and I imagine that the answer may also apply to 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 other brands like Compass Box, where you have a really high end blend that's doing things that other blends aren't doing. So it's sort of a broad question, but specifically for for Black Bull, who's who's I think who's I mean to for it? me the 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 dream is always. Um, Monkey Shoulder drinkers, I think Monkey Shoulder have done a fantastic mm. job with that, with that brand. You know, a, a, a bolder flavor with a blended malt rather than a blend, which I think we get the same by going at 100 proof and, no, and non-chill filtering a blend. I think that the result is a, a, a kind of thicker, chewier distillate. Um, mm-hmm. And we have Kylo is the, is the younger Black Bull, 78-year-old blend um and it's 30 bucks a bottle drink it straight great on ice drink it long you know makes a killer old-fashioned for me you're yeah that's and and i think where monkey shoulder have done a great job is that i i I don't even think half the people drinking monkey shoulder know it's scotch Mm. they just (laughs) go in and grab a bottle of monkey shoulder you know Mm -hmm, it's kind mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't really matter to them that it's scotch and or, or, it's, or they certainly don't know it's a blended malt over a blend over a single malt. Sure. They, they just know they've tried it, they enjoy it. It's twenty nine ninety nine, so it's a so it's a step up from the bottom shelf. You're not drinking Dewar's or um, or uh, Jane B or Cutty Sark. They're kind of what your grandfather drunk. <laughs> um, and so that's the kind of transition. And and whether they're coming. Whether that's bourbon drinkers coming in, whether that's you know it's bringing in a younger audience, it's it's not the um, the traditional old white guys that <laughs> you know that we all used to yep. see at, at whiskey fest and um, yep. and yeah and, and just like not taking it too seriously, not taking itself too seriously. So that's who I like to see drinking, you know, drinking Black Bull, um, and then. You transition them, you know, you 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 get them up to the, the twelve year old. Mm, mm-hmm, I mean at, mm-hmm. at the end of the day that's you know, a bit of education. Um twelve year olds sherry cast, the Kylo's American Oak X bourbon. You know, you're you're kind of introducing the, the non chill filtered thing or higher proof. Um and then just seeing if you can get people to to work your way up from a thirty dollar bottle to a fifty dollar bottle, you know. It's uh that's the kind of drinkers we're after, yeah, you know. I don't kind of. think it's. Um, I don't get me wrong. I've got, I mean, I, I've got old bottles of single malt, and and I, I love buying fill your own when I'm at distilleries. I love, yep. you know, when I'm at Glengarry or or Glendronic or at Bowmore or wherever, I'll, I'll I'll always go and get the fill your own bottles and and open them and drink them. But, um, you know, sometimes you just want like a highball. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm not going to yeah. stick them in a highball. I'm going to put Black Bull Kylo, <laughs> and and you know drink it long and um, and and that's most of what I'm drinking. I would say. Yep, that makes yeah. makes good sense. Um, yeah. If I can, if I can get us out with just one more question. I was going to hand over the hosting reins to you and okay. and let you guys finish off the okay. conversation. I really do apologize, but no, it's not. No worries. And, and yes. I am happy to come back if you if you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem. Love to continue I'm, just, the I'm, chat. I'm literally twiddling my thumbs, waiting for a container. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let me uh, let me uh, hand over the uh, the hosting rights to you, Jason. Yeah. All right. Enjoy Good the, luck dentist. At the dentist, man. Yeah. Thank you. Trying to keep them all. Let's see what happens. Uh, I just got <laughs> braces off. I feel you. Oh, hey, wow. <laughs> that's, I was gonna. I was gonna say. I, I, I noticed about a hundred percent less metal in your mouth. It was. Yeah. I, I basically had braces the whole of lockdown. Like I got them six weeks before yeah. the end of the year, and uh, and then by the following March we were in, and so I timed it perfectly. I'm yeah, like, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, your smile looks great, Pete. Thanks, man. <laughs> Take care, guys. Take it easy. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> So I'm just going to get us out of here with with one more question. I'm going to give you the opportunity, which we haven't really allowed you so far, is to put on your importer's hat. And you'd mentioned in an email that you're bringing in a a, a new brand called Isla Boys in 2022. And 
I'm intrigued. And so could you tell us a bit about that and how it came about and what to expect when it comes in? Yeah, this is, this is a pretty funny one. I don't, uh, the Isla Boys um, are part of the, the Isla Brewery. They own the Isla Brewery, so they're an independent bottler out there doing, doing some whiskies. And it's Mackay Smith and Donald McKenzie. So Donald is, uh, used to work for, for Duga, who's an importer in France. Uh, the Springbank importer, the Brook Laddie importer, <laughs> okay. or historically. So Donald and I have just switched our relationship. He, you know, I used to sell to him, and, all, and now he's now I'm buying from him. You know, and it's kind of the shoe is on the other foot. The power dynamic has has changed. Um, but they've they've got plans, at like a few, you know, a few people. They've got they've got their distillery plans. I think they're they're doing a funding. Um, thing at the moment to to extend the brewery and and, and oh, add the okay. distillery and um, at the moment they're doing some independent bottlings of um, uh, they've got a, a blend a blended malt and a and a single malt um, oh, okay. not distillery named mm -hmm. no age statement mm -hmm. um, but just really really nice peating levels I, I, I you know I tried them and enjoyed them the price point is good when they, I think they're going to sit on the US, you know, on the shelf in the US at a really nice, um, a really nice price. The packaging looks great. And I just thought, yeah, this is, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of people reaching out looking for importers. And I mean, you know, some of the pricing is just insane. Uh -huh. Some of the pricing people are asking for is they're off their heads. There's no uh -huh. way, uh, even more so with Irish whiskies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you, you're like, well, you've you, you've a no age statement blended malt, and you want it to retail it. You know, it's going to retail at a hundred dollars a bottle. Like that's just not going to happen. So, um, so yeah, the, 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 that's why I look at. I'm looking at, you know, the quality of the price, and 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 do we have a chance um, of success? And and working with friends, you know, it's people that I've known for a long time, and and I think we can do a good job importing them and, uh, and, and get them into the US market. So, Well, and, and one of the things in listening to you today is, is hearing how often you've talked about the people that you worked with and the relationships that you had there and, and even the travels and seeing the people where you went on those travels as well. This absolutely is an industry of people. And getting to to hang out and collaborate and dram and catch up, to me, that's the reason for the industry. The whiskey is secondary to that. So, I, yeah, you know, I always I, remember uh, we used to do a roadshow around the Netherlands um, with our with our old importer there, and so there would be, uh, you know, they had four or five whiskey brands, Scotch brands. There was, you know cognac and French wine and South African wine and everyone would come in and we would do all these different venues. So for four or five days every September, I'd go and we'd, we'd travel around and um, and all the, all the Scottish guys got on. And I always remember like all the, the cognac guys in particular, <laughs> like even on the table, Nick, oh, his cognac is shit. My cognac is good. His cognac is not good, you know? <laughs> And, and everyone was always surprised that the Scottish guys were, you know, four or five different distilleries, but we're all kind of mixed in together and got on really well and, and promoted each other's stuff and like, oh, you should try his such yeah, and such, yeah, it's really yeah. good. And, you know, there was no, no, there is com competition, but, sure, sure. you know, but again, I think that kind of, we all realised that, Again, it's that rising tide thing. If, I was going to say that to you, yep. <laughs> if we bring more people into the category and we get them enthused and they like it, then it's going to be good for us all. You know, it's not... Uh, no one has to be left out or no one has to be left behind. And, you know, that's where I see... It's like, I, I see opportunity in the US as an importer. I see, um, you know, distributors. People come to me and say... Again, people I've known a long time come to me and say, hey, can I, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a Scotch brand for Texas. And, and I've already got Duncan Taylor assigned to another distributor in Texas. So if I can bring in the Isla boys and say, look, I've got this really cool little bottler. 
send that to this distributor. Um, yep. And, you know, again, in New York, I, I have tequila and mezcal, and I think we can f find different homes for different people. And you know yourself, not everybody has the same availability of casks, availability of stock, or even desire. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these guys don't want to do 20,000 cases. They're quite happy to do, <laughs> you know, 500 cases a year. We make a nice living. That's just where we want to be. Yep. And yep. so that, if I can help with that, you know, and, and, and have some fun while we do it. And um, I've got to make the most of my fork list, Jason. I bought <laughs> fork lifts. <laughs> I have to use my fork lifts as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've done a magnificent job of bringing us full circle. And until the next time we chat, Pete, thanks a million for your time. It's been brilliant spending time with you. No worries, man. Anytime. Just, uh, just give me a shout. Always happy to call in. <laughs> Cheers. No worries. Thanks ever so much uh, again to Pete. Really appreciate your time uh, as you were waiting for the next load to come in for you to pick up and, and fill your <laughs> warehouse. We're glad you could take time away from your forklift. And he did email us to let us know the load did come in and he did yes. unload it by moonlight. So <laughs> that was terrific news. Uh, uh, it was just a brilliant, brilliant conversation. Um, any big takeaways for you on that one? No, just to reiterate what I said heading into the interview was just what a, what a great whiskey life he's led and he's still a young man. There's still so much for him to, to, to achieve, to think about. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. He's a great guy to keep an eye on. So to those of you in LA, take, take care of Pete Curry for us. He's one of the good ones. Yeah. The only thing that, that I'll say is that while talking with him and, and hearing all of these connections he had, right, where he, he bumps into Kate Watt or the soon to be Kate Watt. And, and all these other people that he's worked with within the industry are also people that grew up in a way within the industry. It kind of felt mm -hmm. like our conversation with Georgie Crawford, where, she, you know, coming from Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, she was there with this person and that person and then went to this, dis this distillery and started working with that person, right? It, it just goes yeah. to show how, how small the industry is. And I think it was, it wasn't during any one of our conversations, but it was actually a conversation that Sam Filmis and I had with uh, Charlie McLean. It's an interview on YouTube. If you go to the Impex Beverages uh, YouTube page, you'll actually see that conversation with us. And during that conversation, he said, you know, the industry is so small that everybody either knows one another or knows of one another. There, there's, there are no new yep. names that you say, oh, huh, I, I don't know that <laughs> name. We, we all kind of know Who's each that? other. <laughs> <laughs> and I like, so I liked that aspect. I really liked hearing him talk about his moving up within the, the industry and talking about all these people. And it, and it was just like what Georgie was saying as she moved up within the industry as well. Yep. No, I agreed wholeheartedly. I, I think of it as the whiskey family tree. Yeah. And 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 so many of the branches are are known or recognizable and and you can sometimes branch hop as you get to to meet people and speak with people. Yeah. Fun. Fun yeah. industry. Yep. Yeah, indeed. So we have a bit of news to share. So Jason I've been trying to wake up the paper boy. I think he's made a New Year's resolution to not listen to me. Could you try to wake him up for me? He's been inspired by your daughters. <laughs> exactly. Time to get up for school. Turn your alarm louder. I know it's on, but it's not loud enough to wake you. <laughs> That's exactly the conversation I just had with the paper boy. Here he is. Extra, extra. Read all about it. Life story of Playboy. Oh, Jason, lead us off. What I know you have a bit of news that you want to share with our listeners. I do, I do, I do, I do. So we've spoken about it on previous episodes. 
for the United States online membership, we have now bottled, labeled, and successfully shipped to California mm-hmm. our Catoctin Creek Distilling Company X Colhoman PX Cask Rye Release. Whew, that's a lot of words. So let's 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 break that down a little bit. So anytime someone purchases whiskey or other spirits from our website, it ships from one of our retailers who who's in California. Indeed. And and this Catoctin Creek we've talked about a little bit. Well, maybe a lot of bit on the podcast. A actually. lot of bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of bit. We we had the actual the cask sampling of it was recorded back July of 2021 and then went into an episode, maybe in July, maybe in August. Uh, w- wait, is that is that correct? Wow. God, time, yep. time flies, man. <laughs> yes, it does. Well, even the bottle itself, and, and everyone will see this on the label, it was bottled in October. We then labeled it December. I went through to the distillery, assisted. Uh, that was that was a ton of fun. That was fast. We had 182 bottles, uh, labeled lickety split. It was. Whew, gotta watch where you put your fingers. You get them trapped between bottles. You get them trapped in a label maker. You get them trapped on a capsule sealer that's blazing hot. So you, you gotta be careful. Pay attention. It was my takeaway. Well, you bring up an interesting point here. So that's so me. <laughs> what what got put into the Kilhoman XPX sherry cask was two thirty gallon Catoctin Creek rye casks. It was their no cuts cask, right? So it had the heads, hearts, and tails all in it. And that was about two years of age? Correct, yep. Yep. Married together and then put into the Kilhoman cask. And we got 180-ish, 188, two. you said? 182 bottles? 182. And how many bottles did we think we would get? Uh, 290. Yeah. So we're missing 110 <laughs> bottles. There's something... <laughs> Something is amiss there. I don't know yeah, I'll, what the hell. I'll happened. give you a hint. If you walk into the Catoctin Creek warehouse in rural Virginia, the air tastes amazing. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll give you a hint as to where those 110 bottles went. So, yeah, we, you know, we we were hoping that we'd get a higher outturn. We were hoping we wouldn't get such greedy angels. We did end up in a place where the liquid moved a ton. It's absolutely delicious. Stunning. Yeah, stunning. And that comes with a consequence, which is evaporation. And (laughs) there you go. But the, the thing I wanted to come back to is we've talked, you know, probably now for a couple of years as we've talked through this project, but we've talked about this no cuts. And Becky's talked about it on a previous podcast as well. Essentially what they did was they ran uh, an experiment Mm. to see what it would be like to move from a pot still style distillation, Mm. slow, low and slow, controlling the run, cutting your heads, taking the heart, cutting the tails, really being, I know we kind of make fun of this expression now in the industry, but being hands-on with your flavors. Mm -hmm. Clearly you're not tasting any flavors with your hands, but you're hands-on in terms of you're controlling dials, you're controlling flow rates, that's the hands-on portion. But then Becky would be tasting going through that is this where yeah. i want to do or the or whoever the, the the distiller of the day would be like what's this tasting like is this tasting like Catoctin creek when they then went to run this experiment they essentially want to see what it would be like to run a column still style distillation yeah. where you just run 
everything hard right through the column. And what would that come out like? And so I've, I have had some people say to me, gosh, you know, if, if the heads and the tails are, you know, the poisonous portion of the distillate, you know, how did you get away with having those in the cask? And mm. so really the way to think about it is it's redistillation upon redistillation upon Correct. redistillation, yeah. right? And so it's only quaffable liquid that was leaving that column. But it was it was incredibly fast. At Becky's numbers are something like, we went from a seven or eight hour distillation to a distillation that ran in minutes. Um, the idea being you can get greater volume out of your still. The question for Becky was, is it representing Catoctin Creek yeah. in the way we have built Catoctin Creek? And our answer to that was, it's not. So they only ever did the two-barrel experiment. That's it. Across that entire 10-year history of Catoctin Creek, there have been two barrels of this. Hmm. And we purchased both at two years old, then moved them into the ex Kilhoman PX cask. But one of the things that came up when we then tasted the cask in the summer of 2021, for me in the finish there is still a clearly detectable Catoctin Creek presence. Agreed. And yeah. in discussing it with Scott and Becky, they also agreed and said, yeah, that, that wasn't there at the beginning. That's come about through maturation. And even as we have moved from two 30-gallon casks into this single hoggy, it's been interesting to see the way that over time that Catoctin Creek component has matured into the spirit, into the finished product. Yeah, I, I think one of the interesting things for me about this project, because we, because we went into it knowing that whatever the final product would be, it would not necessarily be fully indicative of the uh, distillery style, right? And, and you and I always, anytime we, we bottle a whiskey, we want to ensure that the distillery character is, is there. It's not hidden by the cask, right? And purchasing these two casks from Catoctin Creek, knowing that it wouldn't fully be what their standard uh, spirit character would, would be, gave us the freedom to say, well, if it's going to be off profile anyway, why don't we really make it something different? And and that's where the Kilhoman XPX cast came into play. Now you've got the sherry sweetness and a bit of dryness and and then the smokiness. And and I'm just, you know, as I'm as I've been thinking about the project over the past couple of years and as we talk about it now, I just can't stop thinking about how thankful and grateful we are to Scott and Becky to allow us to play with their spirit. Because even they know that this is not yeah. indicative yep, of what they do. And they said, you know what, let's have fun with this. We, we trust the process and we trust you guys. And holy crap, how lucky are we to be put in that position, right? Absolutely. And that's partly why being with them at the warehouse in July, tasting this product and having, I, uh, I think it was Scott who on first taste said on the mic, hot damn, right? <laughs> or words to that effect. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. But, but it made me think of, of sometimes when you and I release a whiskey, a cask, and we go months and months and months without tasting it. We go from selection to selling, and we haven't we haven't tasted it since we selected it. It comes into the country and goes to retailers, and we might include it in a tasting. And there are moments when we pour that bottle and we say, wow, that is a good whiskey. Uh -huh. And and it's not because I'm you know trying to get people to put their hands in their pockets, but it's just a, oh, I can see why we selected that. That's really mm -hmm. damn good. And it was so nice to have that moment from Scott and Becky where they got to say, boy, we've given you boys room to experiment here. 
But wow, that's a tasty little Catoctin Creek offering. Yeah. And so I, I love that aspect of it as well. It's been a, a wonderful project from start to finish. So let's talk quickly about how this is going to work from a from a sales standpoint. Mm-hmm. So this this episode is going to go live on January 12th. So hello, everybody, Correct. and welcome to January 12th, 2022. Hello in the future. <laughs> 22. And the lottery is going to open on Thursday, January 13th. Indeed. And we'll run... Thursday and Friday, I think, right? Indeed, indeed. And then we'll let the winners know uh, that they've won on Monday, January 17th, and give them the URL. And this will be one bottle per person, correct? It will be, yep. And then we'll be able to start shipping bottles that week. Yep, we will. Already got that cleared with shippers, so... The week of uh, January 17, we're back in business again. Single Cast Nation rides again. A ba-boom. So, so that's cool. So that's the, that's the rye. Do we want to talk about any other releases for the, for the remainder of this month? Yeah, I, I think given that this goes live on the 12th, I think it's worth talking about a couple of, of Oishi casks hmm. <laughs> that, that we've got. And so this will be our first foray into the Japanese whiskey realm. And we've got Koji uh, Koji fermentation going on here. Mm -hmm. We've got some really interesting cask maturation, which I don't know if if you agree with me on this one, Joshua, but but the style of cask maturation we've got here makes me think of our Westland selections. Oh, yeah, right, because one of them is Muscatel, right? So this will be the second Muscatel cask we release in in a six month time frame or so, which is kind of cool. And and then the other one is Sherry. Classic. Right? Yeah, so a classic profile with a, a more unusual spirit style, right? It, like you had said, I, and, and I like that you led with that, with the koji as part of the fermentation. So this is a very traditional style of distillation. It's a distillation, uh, or it's a rice distillate, I should say. And in the mm-hmm. fermentation process, not only do they include yeast, but they include koji, and the koji helps along with fermentation. It actually increases the amount of yield that you get at the end of the overall process. But a very cool thing that koji does is it eats away at anything within the fermentation process that can be converted into methanol, or any sulfury sort of compound. So when, when it comes time to distill this ferment, it goes through a single distillation in a stainless still, not copper, stainless. So it's such a clean, clean spirit, very light, very floral. Uh, but then you go into this muscatel cask, right? So big, big, a bit brooding, but a nice sweetness to it. And then a nice, rich sherry cask as well. So I I think it was Elijah who may have said, in the history of Single Cast Nation, these are the two most exciting bottlings, for him at least. (laughs) (laughs) Hope you like them, Elijah. (laughs) <laughs> so, so there was, so there, yeah. yeah. So, so there'll be email going out around that uh, to make sure that we've got our shipping in place for those mm-hmm. outturns. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. I know one of them is in the two hundreds and one is in the one hundreds. So you are correct. The Oishi from the uh, from the Sherry Hagi is only a hundred and eighty six bottles. But the Uishi from the Muscatel was 266 bottles. And here's the crazy thing, too. Last thing I'll say about these. People will see the ABVs and scratch their heads, right? Because the, the Sherry one is 43.9%, and the Muscatel is 40.5%. <laughs> and those are... <laughs> and and th- that's natural cask strength. It and is. these aren't particularly old. The sherry is seven years old. The muscatel is six years old. And so you say, 
well, why such a low ABV? Mm-hmm. I will tell you, Jason. And I will not only tell my listeners, I'll tell your <laughs> listeners as well. Be- the way the distillation process goes, because the fermentation is so clean, similar, in a way similar to the Catoctin Creek that had no cuts, this mm-hmm. also has no cuts. However, this is batch distilled rather than uh, continuous distillation with the Catoctin mm. Creeks. And what Oishi does is they take every drop, heads, hearts, and tails, all together, and they, they don't they don't take any cuts whatsoever. And by the time the distillation is done, the overall ABV of the spirit that goes into cask is naturally at around 45, 46%. And so you, you just simply can never get to a high ABV. They, they don't have a climate like Kentucky where the ABV can go up. Yeah. Uh, it, it, am I right in saying it's a Scottish like climate that sees a, a Scottish like evaporation? Angel share? Uh, you would not be correct. So interestingly Perfect. enough, latitudinally, right? latitude is horizontal. Yeah. Yep. Flat. So lat- latitudinally, um, the Kumamoto, uh, Kumamoto, Japan, it lines itself up pretty close to Georgia. So it's it's kind of mm. like a southern state. However, for whatever reason, they're they're not getting these extreme fluctuations uh like you'd experience yeah it is mountainous right and and they will get you know but there's valleys as well too it's every terroir is a bit different um and while it does line up closer to where georgia is you do just have a different climate going on but that's what i mean about it it's mountainous in the way that Scotland's mountainous. You have those kind of mild summers. You oh, have those kind of yeah, mild winters. Yeah, yeah. I'm not talking about latitude or you know geogra- geographical location, but mm-hmm. that similarity in topography that we are mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you're alluding to here. Mm-hmm. And I know that it's got a pretty gentle angel share, but it does. Yeah, very gentle. Not not too far off from Scotch whiskey. Yep. There you go. That was the exact point I was setting up. Oh, look at you. Professional, professional. We went the long way, but we got there. So, yeah, I, I'm excited to get those released. And those will be shipping in January as well. Um, nation members in the United States for online release. Keep an eye on your, your inboxes, your emails, your Facebook members, pages, your social medias. Oh, gosh. It's all singing, all dancing, isn't it? The that word, it is. The word is being spread constantly. In multiple ways, in multiple places. You know, the bird, 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 the bird is the word. Huh, that's odd. I thought that would be big news. You thought what would be big news? Well, there seems to be an absence of a certain ornithological piece. A headline regarding mass awareness of a certain avian variety. What are you talking about? Oh, have you not heard? It was my understanding that everyone had heard. Heard what? Brian, don't! (laughs) I hope you have overlaid that here for a second or two. (laughs) Is is there any more news to share? If there isn't, I wanted to... I am going to leave January there. I will will very quickly say we, we got such wonderful news over the break that the wolf... Island bottling with the sheep on the label is sold out of the warehouse in California. It has all gone to distributors, to retailers. Look for it on your shelves. Um, at gosh, what sixteen hundred bottles that came in in November out of the warehouse by December. Amazing! Brilliant! 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 Yeah, yeah. Hu- huge thanks to Impex. For working with our distributors on that, huge Absolutely. thanks to our distributors and all the shops and bars that uh, and restaurants that have been supporting this. You know, I heard from Melissa uh, Ginsburg, who's the Impex rep in Minnesota, and she said a large restaurant chain purchased a good number of cases of of the Wolf Island. So it's just so great to think of our whiskeys on a restaurant shelf like that. <laughs> that gets me excited. <laughs> Well, that gets you excited. Elijah sent us a photo, I think, from High Time of a floor display 
And we got to see this in a floor display with what, four, five, six cases? Stacked, open, come in, take a bottle, take two, take three, keep moving. Ah, oh, I loved seeing that. That was absolutely brilliant. Speaking of, of clearing out the warehouse, our ROW number three release, our rest of the world, is almost cleared out of the warehouse now in Scotland. That's making its way off to pastures new to be experienced uh, around the world. Uh, the UK, I, I know people who were buying that out the UK over the winter break and having a blast. Uh, so that's been brilliant to see. And then retail release number eight in the US that came in in November along with the Wolf Island. Yeah, That's been ticking along as well. So Elijah's been doing great. Jess has been doing great. Consumers, distributors, importers. We had a really strong end to 2021. And I know in our first week of meetings among the four of us, we're looking to build upon that close oh, to have yeah. that continue and, and grow in, in 2022. So also sincere thanks to those regular listeners who go down to their local liquor stores and whiskey shops and, and support us there as well. Yep. Sincere thanks there. Yes, yeah, sincere thanks. Yep, wonderful. And here endeth the quick news segment. Well, as we've told our listeners for the past few episodes, you know, we're, we're not going to be reading emails. There are other things I want to read, which are new reviews on the on the Apple iTunes thing. But before I, I go to do that, I just want to remind our listeners that come January 30th, that is going to be the cutoff for questions for our mailbag episode, which will go live on February 12th, I think it is. Is that I right? I said nine. I think we said nine. Do we say nine? Do we say 12? Yeah, I don't think the calendar's changed that much. I know, I know it's 2022, but it's a leap year, Jason. It's actually not. Yeah. So that'll be February 9th. And so we're not going to read any emails, but I wanted to give people an opportunity to send their question in before that uh, January 30th date. So you can email us questions at onenationunderwhiskey.com. You could tweet at us at One Nation Whiskey. You could Instagram us at One Nation Under Whiskey. You could send us a Facebook message. Go to Facebook. Go to the search bar. Type in One Nation Under Whiskey. Search us up, send us a message, and whichever way you want to contact us. Oh, you could even email us at info at singlecastnation.com. We'll accept emails Go there crazy as well, bananas. right? Go crazy bananas. Um, but if you're going to use one of the whiskey ones, be sure to not spell whiskey with that pesky little E. We don't use that E uh, when it comes to us and our business dealings and our podcastings. So, so go ahead and do that. Yeah, in terms of that communication we we did here i was i was pleasantly surprised by this but after our end of of year our year in review episode that dropped december 29 there were a lot of people who wrote in to say i agree that georgie crawford was the number one episode <laughs> of 2021 yeah, yeah, like yeah. that really resonated with people the same way it resonated with us yeah. And I was I was really chuffed to to see that and hear that and read that, so yeah, I, I love it when we get that sense of our listenership mm -hmm. and that we're digging the things that they are digging in the same way for the same reasons. So you know, talk talk about a two part, or we'll have to get you know back to Georgie and have more conversation there as well. Oh, one hundred percent. Yep. Yeah, we got a couple new. Well, we've had a, a few new ratings on Apple iTunes, but we have a few new commented mm. ratings, both both mm. of which are five star. Mm. Uh, one of them came in on December nineteen by must the, have come from my listeners. Uh, <laughs> came in from someone named the Beakmaster B E E K. Oh, yeah, that's, that's one of mine. It is one of yours. See, mine's the Beastmaster, and he has two ferrets. I will name you Hodo, and I will name you, uh, what did he name his little ferrets? Do you remember the Beastmaster? Nope. I, I do remember the Beastmaster movie. I, I don't, don't remember what you've, you've done this bit before, and I, I don't remember oh, the ferrets. So. Hodo and 
I want to say Frodo, but it's obviously not Frodo. Anyway. Well, <laughs> I'm going to name you Kodo. You get a name too, Podo. Kodo and Podo. So the Beakmaster titles uh, their, their review with Whiskey Education and bonus movie reviews. <laughs> <laughs> and like timely ones like Beastmaster. Yeah. Check it out, kids. You'll love it. Uh, Sister Act. Absolutely. Oh, gosh. Let's talk about 1981 movies. Um, <laughs> so the, the statement says, come for the whiskey knowledge, stay for the random movie reviews. Wildly entertaining every week. Nice work, Joshua and Jason. See, this is one of my listeners because they lead with Joshua. He's very smart, this listener. It goes on and says... I've told all of my listeners, if you write in, put Joshua's name first. It's the only way to read it. (laughs) Uh, I've learned a lot over the years about many lesser known distilleries. Keep it going. I love that part. Oh, boy, do we have some things up our sleeve for 2022 then. Yeah, but just... You know, we we spent so much time trying to champion these lesser known distilleries that produce yep. liquid to never yep. be known as single malt, but to go into blends. And it just it, it feels like some of what we talk about is just justified. People are are getting it and glomming onto it. So that makes me very happy. Yeah. It is interesting in hearing that. We've never spoken to anybody from McAllen. We've never spoken to anybody from Dalmore. We haven't spoken to anybody from Glenfiddich. Glenn Livett, right? There's, we're, we're busy. We're busy, mm. man. We're opening yeah, we people's eyes to other options. So then there's another one. Uh, then this one Thanks came through on December 23rd. This is from someone named Tiger's Rule with, mm-hmm. count them, one, two, three, four... Five exclamation points. Oh, very I was hoping you weren't going to. I was hoping you weren't going to say exclamation points. I hope you, I was hoping you were going to say stars or moons or literally anything other than exclamation points. So if if this, three if three exclamation points is the sign of a syphilitic mind, yeah, yeah. What is five exclamation points, Jason? This is death. This person is officially <laughs> dead. They are writing to us from beyond the grave. And I'm I'm sorry for their family's loss. It's, oh gosh! Yep, the yep. the syphilitic worms have uh, have got oh. to them. Yeah. So so the interesting thing about this one, for some reason, I can't. It I won't really hope let that's me... not a new listener, and they're they're like, why are these people saying I've got syphilis? I wrote oh, a nice go. review of them. These people are monsters. Oh, my God. We've just lost a listener, thanks to, I almost said you, but us, I led with the syphilis. Always to the syphilis with me. Anyway, so so Tiger's Rules headline says... Five exclamation points. <laughs> Come for the whiskey, stay for the banter. And I love how the, the Beakmaster... I was the body say, said, was come for the whiskey knowledge, stay for the... So this person, the headliner, come for the whiskey, stay for the banter... Five star rating. Thank you again. Tiger's rule. Five exclamation points. Death. Sounds like a Mad Libs for <laughs> Apple reviews of our podcast. <laughs> Insert a noun. Insert an adverb. And so Ti- Tiger's rule says, two of the most knowledgeable and fun gents in the whiskey industry. Oh, oh gosh. My gosh. gosh. That is yeah. syphilitic. Gosh. Yeah. Poor go tigers. Listen, I'm almost there, which is good. And and uh, second and final sentence, uh, which ends in a singular exclamation point, by the way. You learn a lot and have a ton of fun tuning in. There you go. That's it. I want that on my gravestone. We had a ton of fun and learned a lot while tuning in. It's a really weird gravestone. And it doesn't even rhyme, so that doesn't make sense. And to, and to be honest, I'm going to be composted anyway, so I will not be a person with a gravestone. Oh, you're not going to be one of those trees? You know what I'm talking about? Where they... Yeah. Yeah. Is that what they're doing? That you're going to put a little acorn? Put an acorn I'm, in your butthole and bury you and then... Uh... <laughs> what do you mean when I'm dead? <laughs> <laughs> That's how I start every day. <laughs> it's the only way I can stop drinking. Morning, hon. Just go downstairs, <laughs> grab the acorns. 
<laughs> oh, dad's drinking again. No kids. That was the acorn. <laughs> ah. Oh, gosh. Oh, so, so, so good. So much fun. Thank you to Tiger's Rule, five exclamation Tiger's points. Rule. And uh, and the Beastmaster, or sorry, the Beakmaster. The Beakmaster. <laughs> well, uh, so I called, I called Tiger's Rule Go Tigers, and you called Beakmaster Beastmaster. So we're really appreciative of your reviews. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time. We couldn't even remember your name. Um, I, I just wanted to say this, a quick response to, to our friend Beakmaster there was... You and I talked in the beginning of the episode about getting together January 2nd and just having a quiet little dram together. Mm. But we spent a large portion of that hangout time talking about whether you can skip Back to the Future 2 and whether mm. you can simply go first Back to the Future, third Western Back to the Future and not worry about the really depressing one that was incredibly prescient <laughs> in between. So I just want to make it clear... Even when well, there's no mics, there's no recording button, you and I still just sit and talk utter shite about movies. It's just what we do. That is what we do. <laughs> it's, it's, Five exclamation points. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, before 2016, uh, Back to the Future 2 is a much more enjoyable film. But yeah. <laughs> still kind of depressing, though. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Kind still, of, yeah it was, still became, you know, boss of the town he was dystopian right i mean it really was it showed it was a dystopian future that needed a hero to to fix things well i think we always remember it as the movie with the hoverboards and we forget about it as the horribly dystopian movie that it was was it dystopian just because of biff or because people wore two ties at once that's another problem <laughs> 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 that was good That's, I like that part I, I, It's funny because actually when I said people remember it for the hoverboards I've totally, in my own mind I'm like, you forgot to say The self-tying Nikes Oh the, yeah, the self-tying Nikes Yeah, Right, we, we remember it for that reason as well I, I don't want there to be listeners out there who say That Jason, he didn't even mention the self-tying Nikes What, the, what does he know about Back to the Future 2? <laughs> uh, I know yeah. plenty So Who has I a syphil- my own syphilitic corner. mind? Hmm? <laughs> I'm still I'm still overcoming uh, Go Tigers slash Tigers rule and uh, and all of that barrage of exclamation it was like exclamation point Bukaki. On that note, Jason, I'd like to thank you. Your always. listeners, my listeners, our listeners for tuning in as always. Absolute brilliant time hanging with you. Uh, you know what, Jason? This is something I'll, I, I, ne- I need to tell you and I need to tell both our listeners. Uh, I'm no longer in a real pissy mood. I feel much better having spent time with you and our listeners. I told you. I told you. I would do my best. My listeners would really come to the, come to the rescue. And I'm so glad you've delivered that. I would even say it's been so successful. I think your listeners pulled their way as well. That they did, Jason. That they did. So... I raise my glass to you. I raise you. my glass to our listeners and to everyone for a 2022 that hopefully is in some way, shape, or form better than 2021 and 2020. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, yours is so much better. Yes, it is. I spent the whole of winter break practicing. Thank you.